Meeting of the Board of Education will now come to order. Roll call. Meek? Here. Myers? Here. Page? Aye. Here. Peter <laughs> Peterson? Here. Ray? Here. Williams? Here. Weiniger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? All right, moving right into item number three, the DCSD spotlight, multiple uh, folks to be recognized this evening. Over to the superintendent. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, tonight, we have the privilege of recognizing two amazing high school teachers and one very impressive high school student. So let's start with our incredible high school educators. Two of our high school educators have been named Life Changers of the Year. Would the following people please join me up front? Nadine Klein, science and psychology teacher from Daniel C. Oaks High School, along with her principal, Brian Singleton, and executive director of schools, Dan McMinnemy. And then we're also going to have Eli Moore come on up. And he is the performing arts guitar instructor from Legend High School, um, along with principal Jason Jacob, and executive director of schools, Christian Drury. Come on up. Nadine and Eli are two of only seven teachers nominated from Colorado. Life Changer of the Year is an annual program recognizing K-12 educators and school employees across the country. The program celebrates those who are making a significant difference in the lives of students by exemplifying excellence, positive influence, and leadership. So Nadine, I'd love to start with you, and I have seen you in action over at Daniel C. Oaks. We are so proud of you. Can you tell me a little bit about what this means to you? Um, well, I'm super overwhelmed, first of all. But I have to say that um, just being nominated for this recognition means that my 27 years life work as a professional educator means something and is valued and that's super validating for me but maybe even more important is that this shines a little light on the incredible life-changing work that happens every single day at Oaks in the hands of our entire staff and that's a team I'm really proud to be a part of. You are so right about DC Oaks. Brian and Dan, would you like to say a few words about Nadine? Yes, thank you. Um, Nadine is one of our most important tenured teacher at Oaks. Um, we've had a lot of turnover in the past couple years, and she is part of the glue that keeps our kind of old guard together and meshes with our new teachers, which we have several of. The way you um, describe the award itself, um, I could say that's an exact description of Nadine. Um, not only is she an excellent teacher in the classroom, but she is a leader on campus. Uh, she is one of our most instrumental people in our outdoor ed program. All of our kids just adore her, and the rest of our staff really relies on her. And I just got to say, I am super lucky to have the opportunity to work with her and just love everything that you do, Nadine. It's awesome. And I would just say I've known Nadine for several years, and she's an amazing educator and even a better colleague. So thank you for everything you do every day and really appreciate the work that you do and know that our kids are in great hands when they're in your classroom. And Eli, I have been in your classroom as well, and it's your turn. Tell us a little bit about what this means, what this award means to you. Well, thank you for inviting us and congratulations to you as well, Nadine. Uh, 27 years for me as well. And uh, it's been an honor to start out as a teacher and most of my years here in this district, 24 I think it is now, uh, thinking that I would be teaching something else. 
So being a special educator to start, and that's what the degree is in, to be able to start up Douglas County's first guitar program in 2004 and, and now see a bunch of programs out there and, and be a part of so many classrooms and kids wanting to try a different kind of elective. It's been real special, and it's an honor to even be a teacher, let alone uh, be here tonight for this. So thank you. Well, I've had the privilege of, of knowing Eli for many years, over about 20 years, but I, th I don't think there is probably a, a student, a parent, a staff member, um, anybody. If you know this guy, you love him. Um, he, he genuinely connects with people, he genuinely cares about people, and he goes the extra mile to um, connect and take care of, of, of a lot of people. Um, you know, he teaches guitar, as you heard him say, but he has... Uh, um, I think what's what's unique about that is that a lot of students, you know, that typically don't like school, they love Eli and they love coming to his class. So the connection that he makes with those kids, that's why they want to come to school, and he makes them better people and gets them through their days at times and gets them through high school. So he has that kind of impact with, with students, but he also is a mentor to a lot of younger teachers and just teachers and, and staff members in Douglas County in general. So I love him like a brother. He's been a huge asset to me in our building from a culture lens. And um, just appreciate you and congratulations. Couldn't think of anybody else that would be very deserving of this award. So congratulations, bud. Side hug. Eli, I too have been privileged to watch you work your magic in your classroom. You truly bring this passion and fun that is unparalleled and you give some kids a home in that big building that truly is very special. Thank you for the difference you've made for all of our kids and the entire education community. You've left an impact and you've left your legacy. We appreciate you. Yeah. Don't leave yet. <laughs> Directors Ray and Director William are here to give you your awards and we'll take some pictures. Maybe we'll take some pictures. Oh yeah, you're right there. <laughs> Okay, now we are going to shift to one very, very impressive young lady. We get to honor an incredible Douglas County High School junior. Maya Aries, please come on up here and join me. Along with your principal, Tony Kappas, Executive Director of Schools, Erin McDonald, and our DCSD Sustainability Coordinator, Beth Church. Maya was selected to receive the Colorado Alliance for Environmental Education's 2023 Award for Excellence. Big mouthful and really <laughs> impressive. For her outstanding young environmental leadership, Maya will officially receive her award at a ceremony this Friday evening. Maya, can you tell us? Well, first, let's give Maya a big round of applause. Maya, tell us a little bit about what this award means for you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the recognition. I think for me, I'm just flattered that uh, the work that I've done has started to become noticed. And so in middle school, I actually had an advanced social, social entrepreneurship class that I had the privilege of being a student in. And so in that class is where I got to become more aware about the issues in our world and how I can make a difference. And so I've grown up in a Jewish background and household where I've learned the phrase tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. 
And so I've lived by that phrase, repairing the world. How can I repair the world, not only in my day-to-day -day life, but over time? And so for me, I'm very passionate about the environment. I love doing outdoor activities. And so I chose to make a stand and talk about plastic pollution in our community and in our environment. And so I'm just honored to be here and for that award because I've worked really hard and I'm glad that it's being recognized. So thank you. Amazing. I'm sure Mr. Kappas has a thing or two to say about Maya. Pretty tough to follow, isn't it? What an amazing individual. You know, as an educator, I've been in the business for over 35 years. And every once in a while, one just rises to the top and you recognize this individual, Maya being one. And you know that someday you can predict with certainty greatness. And not that she's not great now. I love her to death. And I was joking with a colleague. I wish I could clone her. And I'd make like you know, 12 or 15 of her. I mean, can you imagine going into this world with somebody with this much talent and passion? So I am blessed that you've crossed my path and you are in my life. And I thank you for all you've done for the school. And I appreciate you. Congratulations on such an amazing recognition. Uh, we need students like you, the voice that shines through, and you're only a junior, so we have you a whole nother year to continue to make an impact on our Castle Rock and our whole Douglas County community. So congratulations. We look forward to see what the future has in hold for you, because it's going to be amazing. Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, Maya, Maya. Oh, we love this girl. We, uh, Kim Rankin and I noticed her on um, TED Talk. Uh, she did a Cherry Creek um, talk for, about plastic pollution, and we instantly wanted to have her be a, a presenter over at our Green University, and she just blew us out of the water. Teachers and all, she taught, taught us so much. And from there, she's still teaching. She's still teaching our even younger students about plastic pollution and about just recycling, right? And, and, about plastic. I mean, it's just amazing. You were, you were an inspiration, honey. Keep it up. Nice job. <laughs> Director Williams is here to give you your certificate. Excuse me, Director Myers is here to give you your certificate. <laughs> All right, we'll do some pictures. You do it. Get in there. Oh, I should probably display this. Yeah, okay, there we go. Come on up, Bob. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I almost wanted to do one, two, three. I was telling you, right? That concludes tonight's recognitions. Thank you. Okay, one last round of applause for all our recognees this evening. Okay, moving on to item number seven, acceptance of agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion by Williams. Second. Second by Myers. Go ahead and take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Moving into item number eight, superintendent updates. Ten minutes. Thank you very much, President Peterson, <laughs> for that very subtle introduction. <laughs> um, all right, uh, DCSD is very proud to have 29 National Merit semifinalists. We will be recognizing all of them at a future board meeting. We are also going to celebrate Parker Core Knowledge Charter School as they were named a 2023 Blue Ribbon School. Um, and that's a big national award, and we're looking forward to being able to celebrate with them. Highlands Ranch High School teacher, Boss Wolf, has been named the Junior Achievement Rocky Mountain Educator of the Year. Boss will be formally recognized by Junior Achievement next week, and we are, of course, making arrangements to honor him at a board meeting in the near future. Congratulations, Boss. Earlier today, many of our DCSD departments participated at a hiring fair at the ACC Storm Collaboration Campus, so that was great. 
Um, our first parent university of the school year is scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, September 27th. The topic is concussion process and school sports. Parent university is a partnership between our district and Sky Ridge Medical Center. The Foundation's Building the Dream Gala is taking place this coming Friday evening at the Legacy Campus, and I know some of you will be joining us. I will be there as well, and we're really looking forward to um, raising money for our Douglas County schools um, all across our district. And thanks to the Foundation for all of their hard work to put this event on. Our Apple Award nominations already open on Monday, October 2nd, so we'll be advertising that widely to make sure that our families um, and students have an opportunity to nominate their favorite educator for an Apple Award. Douglas County Youth Congress is right around the corner on Tuesday, October 3rd. We will be having Colorado Proud School Lunch Day, also on Tuesday, October 3rd. This is a special meal that is served at all of our traditional elementary schools because it will, the meal will feature Colorado-grown products and companies. Um, in addition, Nutrition Services will be holding a farmer's market at Redstone Elementary from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The District Accountability Committee will be hosting its Career Pathway Expo on Thursday, October 26th at the Legacy Campus. More information about that event will be coming out soon. It was a huge success last year thanks to uh, the efforts of our DAC and our Legacy Campus folks. Um, and we just got lots and lots of exposure for our different pathways that we offer in Douglas County and for our kids. Um, September is Hispanic Heritage Month, and there have been a couple of significant celebrations in our district. Conexion, DCSD's Spanish language family group, held its first Hispanic Spare Heritage Month celebration at the Legacy Campus on September 19th. The celebration was a great night full of food, family, and fun with a live band, dancing, and even a piñata. Um, thanks so much to the Conexion group for, ce for celebrating with our families and our students. Last year, Castle Rock Middle School celebrated Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month with a series of celebrations. This year, there was a desire to involve more students and classes, so it grew to be a whole assembly, a school assembly that took place on September 15th. During the assembly, our Castle Rock Middle School staff, students, and community members were honored to have special guests from Mexico and from uh, the, con the and to have the Consul General of Mexico um, that that's in Denver. The group um, from Mexico, I'm not going to get the name right. Banda, I, I can't. I'm so sorry, and I really apologize that I did not prepare in advance to pronounce it. But it consisted of 24 student musicians who traveled to the United States to perform lively selections for those in attendance. The musicians also performed at the State Capitol and the Denver Center for Performing Arts. Um, Castle Rock Middle School World Language and ELD teacher um, Rocio, who all of you met earlier um, in the year because she was recognized for an award, she coordinated the event and secured a visit um, from the General Council of Mexico in Denver. So congratulations to Castle Rock Middle School and the students for celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month in such a special way. That concludes our superintendent updates. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Moving into item number nine, public comment. The purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing our Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. Time has been adjusted to allow speakers the opportunity to speak during the allotted time for public comment. Each speaker will be afforded the ability to speak once during the public comment session. Three minutes will be allotted to each speaker uh, this evening. When speaking, please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests and staff in the room. To respect a speaker's free speech, please do not interrupt them while they're at the podium providing comments. You have a 15 second notice prior to the end of your time so you can wrap up your comments. When your time is up, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so while being respectful and honoring the next speaker's time to speak, or please do not engage speakers and other audience members in a disruptive manner. And we will start tonight, uh, I believe, with Jake Oliver from the SAG, who will be on remotely to provide comments, and then two more students. Just as a reminder, these students are not held to the three-minute time limit. Mr. Blair, do we have Jake Oliver online? Okay, great. Jake, can you hear us? Trying to think of other revolutionary figures. Um, 
Jake, you're live. We'll come back to Jake. We'll actually start with Victoria Kish, followed by Jackson Little. Both sorry, students. was that my turn? I'm so oh, sorry. And actually, Jake, can you hear us? What was that? Jake, you're live at the board meeting. Yes. Are you ready to provide your comments for the SAG um, update? Give me 30 seconds. Okay, we will. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't hear you over my classmates. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Jake. Perfect. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so hello. I don't know if I can turn on my camera. Um, but if you haven't met me, my name is Jake Oliver. I am one of the co-presidents for student advisory group this year, and I am really excited to be a part of it. Um, this is my fourth year and we're making some great progress so far. I'm here to provide you a little update on who we are and what we've done so far this year. So we've had three official meetings, two of which have been work session meetings. The first was a more introduction type meeting um, where we just got the members rolling and introduced to their groups um, and they could start brainstorming projects. The first meeting was a bit more of a um, connection to their group members and seeing who they wanted to be leaders, some ideas for brainstorming. And then we also had um, the second meeting where they more refined their ideas and um, selected official leaders. So now um, we're going to get into the 925 meeting minutes. Um, this was our most recent meeting where um, most of the important things happened. We've also had a number of other officer meetings aside of that, um, where we did more, more planning type things and um, organized the group as a whole. So is everyone able to see the meeting minutes for 925? Yeah, Mr. Blair, do you have those meeting minutes? Yeah, we don't have the meeting minutes, Jake. Okay, I do believe I attach them in an email to Ms. Brockman, um, but I will send them out again. Actually, it might be easier if I just go over them um, verbally. So first we had our welcome activity and introduction. Um, members were welcomed and we played a little icebreaker for about 10 minutes. Then we also reintroduced our officers, liaisons and board members. Then after that, we went straight into the MLO vote and resolution um, to, to approve a resolution that we drafted um, endorsing the MLO and bond on the ballot this November. I'm going to read that for you. Um, Director Ray should also have a copy. Yes, Director Ray has a copy. Go ahead, Jake. Perfect. I'm just having a little trouble with my computer right now. Um, so I don't have it verbatim, but it essentially said that we are the students who can constitute the student advisory group um, and that we are responsible for serving and advocating student needs in the district, primarily educational, ex um, educational quality, educational outcomes and academic excellence. For these reasons, we support the um, MLO and bond questions on the November 7th ballot this year um, to increase personnel retention and the ability to hire new personnel, as well as build new schools and update our current schools to better serve our growing communities and continuing communities. We also urge that student um, voters support our district as a whole, as well as the families that are coming to our district looking to make it their home. That passed unanimously. Um, after that, we did a board of 
education update and focus group recommendations. We have assembled a document for the members that essentially just covers um, the big related ideas for their um, for their subgroup topics. And then we kind of broke down what those were. And we just wanted to give the um, students a little bit more time to engage with that material. We also went over um, the Heroes Gala and Youth Congress, congratulated a couple people. After that, we tried to move into subgroup time because we are this year we're really trying to value their subgroup time so they can have the most um, the most time and effort to really build those quality proposals that we see at the middle of the year and the end of the year. Um, we announced subgroup leaders during those times. This year it was um, an application, though that was more for our own record keeping than it was for actual um, official titles. During subgroup time, each of the subgroups mostly worked on refining ideas, eco-sustainability, um, discussed multiple projects regarding energy, landscaping, and waste, diversity and equity, discussed continuations of project from last year, and an academic equity project. Academic Excellence made progress on continuations from last year's projects, including financial literacy, IBHK, and hands-on learning. IBHK is a, um, it's an academic excellence policy. This year, we're focusing on the CTE and college readiness pathways. School Safety brainstorms, I, brainstormed ideas for projects this year, though they have yet to decide on one. Um, from what I hear, they are making good progress. Mental health discussed peer counseling, sources of strength, and continuation projects. Um, as a leadership team, we worked on planning for future meetings and events to better serve the district and the students. Um, we should be getting more information on that soon. That would bring us to the end of our meeting with our final announcements and dismissal. Um, and we've also, during that time covered some of our um, responsibilities to other board committees and superintendent intended committees where we distrib or we made recommendations and ensured we had students to cover all of the committees that we need student representatives for. Other than that, we haven't um, we haven't made any other major progress that you all um, will need detailed updates on, though you will be getting updates about that soon. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oliver. We'll now move on to our next speaker, Victoria Kish, followed by Jackson Little. Hi, I'm Victoria and I'm from, I'm a junior at Legend High School and I'll be talking about the traffic um, in the beginning of school. So not too long ago, my classmate got into a car accident. This happened on Hilltop Road while she was on the way to school. She was trying to get to school like any other day and the traffic was four times worse than any other day, um, which caused her to get into an accident. This is one of the ex examples of crashes that happened just in the last couple of months due to the five minute difference between the start times at Cimarron Middle School and Legend High School. They are right down the street from each other. One of our other concerns are emergency vehicles not being able to get to where they need to due to the blockage of both sides of the road, which could result into many bad things as, ne as we never know what severe emergency they could have. To add on to this, parents get very stressed out and worried about the traffic taking their kids to school. This causes parents to, um, to stress like my or to speed like my classmate when she got hit. In a NBC News article, it states that 27% of parents feel like their jobs are at risk in order to meet their child's transportation needs, and 40% say that their work schedule is affected at least once a week due to the shuttling their kids around. Same can go for high schoolers when they're bringing their siblings to school. Lastly, the education of high schoolers and middle schoolers are being put at risk due to the delay of traffic as the traffic causes them to be tardy, making them miss instructions and learning. Also at Legend High School, if we get many tardies, we can fail that class. 
This is why I wanted to propose if Cimarron Middle School was to start later than Legend High School, the traffic would not be as an issue due to the fact that most of the traffic comes from the direction of the road from both schools. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Kish. Next will be Jackson Little, followed by Robert, Nort Robert Norton and Meg Furlow. Is Jackson here? Hello, my name is Jackson and I'm here with my friends Oliver and Mikey. We are all juniors at Legend High School and we have some, we have some thoughts about the new Douglas County High School, uh, Legend High School schedule. Last year, the Legend High School schedule was to have an eight period day every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, and school would start at 7.50. Cimarron Middle School would start at 7.30, meaning Legend High School students would be able to get to school and class on time with no traffic. In the 2023 to 2024 school year, Legend's schedule has changed to now start at 7.35, conflicting with the Cimarron start time. This then causes both students and parents from both schools to experience heavy traffic on Hess and Canterbury Road. When talking to my peers about this schedule, it is not only me and my friends that don't like it, it is mostly everyone. This schedule causes many problems with classwork and teacher availability. <clears throat> One example being, if you have a homework assignment on Monday, due Wednesday, and are confused about it, you don't see that teacher until Wednesday. So there's no way for help unless you go in during class or after school. The teachers say this helps the students by gaining more class time with them per day. This contradicts with that because after doing research, you lose 20 minutes per week with each teacher, eventually leading to 30 hours in total. In this year, you are losing with every single teacher. After school, many kids in Legend High School have jobs, younger brothers and sisters, and other responsibilities to take care of outside of school, including myself. This along with the schoolwork that is assigned at home make it very stressful because again, we are losing time with the teachers. This leads to a great amount of learning being left on us without any assistance. This also leads to the amount of sleep needed to get the, prop to get the proper amount of sleep. You need to go to bed at 10 p.m. and wake up at 6 for the average teenage kid. Most nights I am up until at least 11.30 doing work that is assigned to me along with everything else that you have to do after school, as I said before. Overall, we have many problems with this schedule and we would like to solve these by implementing the old Douglas County High School schedule we kn that we know worked with everyone, including the parents and teachers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jackson Little, and thank you to all our students who uh, came out and spoke tonight. Next, we have Robert Norton, Meg Furlow, followed by Susan Retton. Esteemed school board members, district staff, and Superintendent Kane, my name is Robert Norton. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy and a former law enforcement officer. I've had the pleasure of serving as a middle school teacher in the Douglas County School District for the past 10 years. The safety of my students is my number one priority, but I am not allowed to do all that I can to save lives in my school. You are keenly aware that our schools have become soft targets for violence in our society. The likelihood that I will encounter an active shooter in my school continues to be a daily reality for me. Unfortunately, current district policies prohibit me from doing all that I can to save lives. During a lockdown, I am still expected to guard against an active shooter by placing my body between bullets and a closed classroom door to protect my students. In this horrific instance, I am the first responder. However, I am not permitted to use my qualifications and willingness to defend and save not only my life, but the lives of the children that have been entrusted to me and my school's care. In my most recent lockdown drill this year, as the locks, light, out of sight alarm repeatedly sounded, I felt helpless. I felt helpless because the current district security policies and procedures make my students and me vulnerable to harm. If an active shooter enters my classroom before I can lock the door, I have no means to defend myself and my students. I cannot defend myself, other children, and adults with deadly force because current policies disarm me every morning before I enter the school building. What parent would not want me, a former law enforcement officer, to do all that I can to protect and save the life of their precious child? What guardian would not want me, a teacher currently qualified in the same firearm standards of training as a Colorado peace officer, to defend the life of their child? What step parent would not want me, trained in emergency response, 
to the same standards as a medical professional to save the life of their child. I believe that we can do more to prepare our faculty and staff to respond to potential violent events and emergencies in our school. The FASTER uh, training I received is a world-class program that enables teachers, administrators, and other school employees to stop school violence quickly and administer medical aid immediately. The high-quality training I received over the past two years ensures that I am prepared with the mindset, knowledge, and advanced skills to save lives. This same training program, supported and endorsed by many law enforcement agencies, has already been adopted by many other school districts in the state of Colorado. I am neither discounting the good work that you have already done to improve safety and security in our schools, nor am I proposing that we replace our security personnel, law enforcement, or medical response. Rather, I'm asking once again that you please consider allowing me to serve as an additional layer of protection in my school. 15 seconds remaining. Please give me a fighting chance by allowing me to defend myself and save the lives of my students and others near me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Meg Furlow, Susan Retton, followed by Martha Carver. Ms. Furlow. Good evening, directors. I'm here to give a comment on the resolution to settle the Colorado Open Meetings lawsuit. While I'm glad a resolution has been reached, there has been extensive damage and fiscal irresponsibility surrounding the board majority choices. You could have settled the lawsuit a few months ago, but because of ego, the costs of this lawsuit are now more than $37,000 higher. President Peterson, you promised during your campaign that you would welcome being held accountable and show humility. At a student forum, you said, we need to bring those two elements back to the district. Humility to admit when you're wrong, because we're not always going to get it right, and then the accountability to say I was wrong, I'm listening, and I will fix it. Then you went on to say, think of accountability. When we are up there, we will own our decisions and have the humility to change course when we are wrong. We expect every taxpayer, parent, student, and teacher in this district to hold us accountable. A judge has ruled multiple times that you broke the law. When will you show humility, accountability, and the leadership that you promised? I am thankful that directors Meek and Ray have been here to be a voice of reason throughout this lawsuit. Specifically, I would ex like to express my gratitude and support of Director Meek for continually asking this board to simply follow the law and stop waiting, wasting district resources. The community appreciates you for trying to be a good steward of taxpayer money and truly putting kids in this district first. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furlow. Susan Retton, Martha Carver, followed by Kelly Pointer. Ms. Retton. Good evening. The District Accountability Committee is a state mandated committee, yet there is no transparency as to the requirements necessary to be chosen to serve. How is one selected? Who determines which candidates will be considered or not considered? This committee acts more like a club with hand-selected invites for new members. Since this committee makes recommendations to the Douglas County Board of Education, the membership guidelines should be public. The DAC recently recommended stripping away all of the updates made to policy KB, parent and family engagement. However, this committee does not fairly represent the views of the people of Douglas County. The school board, on the other hand, was elected by the people to suggest that the DAC is representative of our community and then recommend stripping away parental rights is a deliberate attempt to overturn the vote of the community. The school board members who were elected by the community and who ran on a platform of reinstating the voices of the parent are the ones responsible for representing the views of parents and our community. The up-to-date policy KB must remain in place. It is a fundamental right of parents to direct the education, medical care, and upbringing of their children. The objective of any school district is to prepare children for the future, emphasizing student achievement and strong academics. Gender ideology and pronouns only confuse kids and infringe on the parental rights to direct 
the moral upbringing of their children. Parents also should have the right to opt out of teachings they feel are inappropriate. In addition, the DAC's recommendations that there should be a staff rights section in policy KB should be denied. Our parent community rejects the idea that schools know what is best for their child. I request the board reject the recommendations to policy KB set forth by the DAC and support parental rights. This board should be advancing policies that strengthen parental involvement and increasing and increase transparency, which includes providing information on the requirements and the selection process of those on the DAC. Director Meek and directors Meek and Ray would like to restore trust between the DAC and the board. But when people see this overreach by the DAC, the bigger issue is the trust between the DAC and our parent community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Retton. Martha Carver, Kelly Pointer, followed by Linda White. Ms. Carver. Hi, I am Martha Carver, and I'm the Douglas County Captain for Grandparents for Kids. And Grandparents for Kids would like to applaud the school board for passing the parent and family engagement policy. I am grateful that you wrote this policy to support parents. Parents are the ones who are responsible for raising their children, and as such, they should have a voice in their children's education. Building trust and having open communication is necessary to enhance academic performance. I have heard the DAC state the recommendations to amend this policy, but I do not agree with them. The policy speaks of parental rights as is appropriate. The policy is the parent and family engagement policy and therefore should be focused on parents. As I read the policy, I do not view it as adversarial at all. In fact, it fosters collaboration and trust. The exact wording of the policy is shared responsibility and partnership between family, schools, and community. That is far from adversarial. It is beneficial to include the statement that students will not be compelled to share personal information that conflicts with their deeply held personal beliefs. In addition, as parents are the ones responsible for their child's welfare, it is crucial to provide disclosures on health, identity, and education. How can parents address these issues if they're hidden from them? If parents are not aware of what is affecting their children, then how are they able to help their children and support them? Parents need to be equipped with this information in order to address issues as they occur. So again, open communication is important to assist children to thrive and navigate any health, identity, or educational issues that arise. I support the board, including the statement that it is a parental decision to opt their children from selective materials or activities. If it is redundant to place this in this policy, that is fine. It's not contradicting other policies and reinforces the point that parents can be involved in decisions regarding their children's education. Reading this policy can bring awareness to this option and then parents may locate the details elsewhere. Please retain this policy as is. And again, thank you for standing up for students and thank you for empowering strong families in Douglas County. Thank you, Ms. Carver, Kelly Pointer, Linda White, and then we will transition online with Valerie Thompson. Ms. Pointer. Oh, can't forget this. Good evening, board directors. My name is Kelly Pointer, and I have been a parent in Douglas County Schools since 2009. This is my third year on the District Accountability Committee. In advance of your discussion about board committee areas of focus tonight, I would like to reiterate that the DAC voted unanimously to have the KB subcommittee continue its work on the KB parent and community engagement policy. This subcommittee has met weekly since the end of June and has put in a tremendous amount of work. Whether the subcommittee continues to focus on the approved policy, its implementation, or both, the DAC would greatly appreciate KB remaining as an area of focus. Our work is further supported in state statute that the Board of Education shall work with the parent members of the District Accountability Committee in creating, adopting, and implementing the KB policy. We value your consideration and support to keep KB as one of the DAC's areas of focus. 
Now I would like to talk about 5A and B, the mill levy override and bond that are on this November's ballot. I appreciate that all seven of our board directors support these measures. On August 31st, the DAC unanimously, with staff members abstaining, voted to pass a resolution of support for both of these additional funding measures. In addition, 22 school accountability committees with staff abstaining have already signed on to a joint resolution of support for both 5A and 5B. I expect many more SACs to sign on to the um, resolution in the upcoming weeks. The following groups have also um, given support to the ballot measures 5A and 5B. The, as we heard earlier, the student advisory group, 65 of DCSD's principals, the Parker Chamber of Commerce, the Fund Our Future Student Group, and the Allow Alliance of Douglas County Charter Schools. These are some of the examples and reasons why we need 5A and B to pass. Mountain Vista High School was unable to fill a secondary math teacher opening this year and had to get creative. Mountain Vista Principal Mester Segley stated on numerous, has stated that numerous candidates turned down his offer and decided to wait for and then accept offers in neighboring districts that pay approximately 20,000 more per year on average. Mountain Vista High School lost three teachers and one staff member to just Cherry Creek High, uh, School District in the last six months. There are still unfilled positions in Mountain Vista's maintenance and security departments, and I'm gonna run out of time. So I realize that this is a tough time to ask for additional funding, but it's not gonna get any easier. It's never gonna be a good time. We've only passed additional local funding one time in the last 17 years, and neighboring districts have passed frequently, and that's why they have more funding than us. We need to come together to get 5A and B passed this November. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Pointer. Linda White, then online with Valerie Thompson, followed by Faith Moots. Ms. White. Good evening. I'm Linda White. As founder of Grandparents for Kids, I would like to applaud the school board for the updates to policy KB passed months ago. After the passing of this update, I was hopeful the school district had put this discussion to rest hopeful that all the time, effort, and money spent on this topic could now be shifted to other issues, like academics. Apparently, the DAC feels otherwise by their recommendation to remove these updates. I'm not going to spend time defending parental rights. The vast majority of parents across this county and country want to parent their kids. They do not want the schools to take that role. I am concerned about this DAC. The parents and grandparents in Douglas County elected this board. The board heard us and implemented the updates to policy KB. Maybe we, the people, need to take a closer look at this committee and ask the question, does this committee really represent all voices of parents and grandparents across this county? With this recommendation they are proposing, I would say no to that question. The DAC is a committee made up of unelected people making recommendations for us. I know by law we must have a DAC, but the parents and grandparents of Douglas County did not elect you to be our voices. Is the DAC making recommendations based on political agendas? The DAC should be a balance of all voices in our community. It may be time to take a closer look at this unelected committee and ask for some transparency on how this unelected un committee is selected. It should be a representation of all voices within the Douglas County community. School board members, keep the update to policy KB. Let's move on to issues related directly to academics. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. White. Online, Valerie Thompson, Faith Moots, followed by Tiffany Baker. Mr. Blair is Ms. Thompson online. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Uh, we can if you can lean into your microphone. We can hear you, but it's pretty uh, quiet. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, directors. 
I have spoken now a few times during public comment requesting for you to take the time to meaningfully engage with the parents in the district. Tonight, I'll be brief. Please keep the KB policy in the DAC's priorities and allow the subcommittee that has been working on this policy every week since the beginning of the summer to complete their timeline. A subcommittee that was formed after the idea and support was offered by our liaison at the time, Director Myers. Efforts that the DAC unanimously supports as having a priority. This is a great time and opportunity to work with your advisory committee in a way that is collaborative and demonstrates your thoughtfulness in decision making. The DAC is a committee full of parents that has been grossly misrepresented. The thoughtful comments of members of the DAC during board meeting public comment reflect the same thoughtfulness in all DAC communications to the board. I encourage our board to work with us and see that thoughtfulness in action. And I'll end that the DAC meetings are open to the public and those with concerns should be heard, but when they don't attend our meetings, these concerns are based in hearsay at best. I ask for their attendance in future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Faith Moots, Tiffany Baker, followed by Chad Cox. Ms. Moots. Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Good evening, board members, superintendent, and all those attending in person and online. Thank you once again for the opportunity to speak publicly about concerns with this district. In the past, I've shared bits of my son's journey with neurodiversity, dyslexia being the most impactful on him educationally, and the difficulties we've had with the special ed team and getting him access to a free and appropriate public education. Although his experience continues to be difficult, and I desperately wish I could rewind time, I do appreciate that Douglas County School District has continued to collaborate with our son's team in an attempt to right a wrong that happened over numerous years in the district. Tonight, however, though, I have two things to speak about. The first being information on CoKid, Colorado Kids Identified with Dyslexia, and the second being a very strong concern at CoKid.org and also on CPR.org. The article speaks to the READ Act, the independent evaluators of this so far quite ineffective bill, the deficiencies of iReady, and who to contact in legislation to try to get this, uh, the bill to be considered again, SB 23-181. State approved independent and qualified dyslexia screeners worked with the same sample of kids that the computer system iReady screened, and they identified 60% more children who need early intervention for dyslexia. The READ Act goal is to decrease the number of kids with significant reading deficiencies and to get them to read at grade level by third grade. Only 4% of our children are meeting this goal. How on earth can we help the 20% of students we know that are impacted by dyslexia if the tool we are using is missing 60% of the kids? This math just doesn't add up. So my, my message to the parents and guardians tonight and staff as well is that iReady does not work. It is inaccurate and it is misleading. When you get your iReadies in the mail or in your kid's backpack, you might as well shred them. If you have any concerns whatsoever about your child's reading or writing by first grade, you must intervene. Do not trust your child to learn how to read in Douglas County School District. Call a meeting with the school right away. Get the principal involved, get the district involved. Do not let anyone remaining. fool you into thinking your child will come around or catch on when the time is right or that their behavior is standing in the way of them learning. Dyslexia is real and its impact is incredibly harmful if left undiagnosed and untreated. Trust me, you do not want your high school child reading at a third grade level. The damage done is so very difficult to correct and so very hard. Thank you, Ms. Moots. We now have Tiffany Baker, Chad Cox, followed by Jen Iverson. Ms. Baker, are you online? Yes. A statement with just 31 words could have saved our district thousands of dollars. Tonight, the board is voting on a resolution to pay attorney fees and other costs to the plaintiff in the Colorado Open Meetings Law lawsuit. While there's no accountability for the board spending on behalf of students and taxpayers. $103,000 is a $37 thousand dollar increase since the settlement offer you rejected in may 
and doesn't include the additional fees to cover your expenses for the legal defense for going to trial in June. You were asked in May to agree to the following short statement, which would have saved thousands of dollars from taxpayers, funding that if went unused could have been redirected to teachers and students. This is the 31 word statement that you rejected. The defendants acknowledged that pursuant to the legal advice of counsel, they had non-public discussions among three or more members concerning public business in violation of the Colorado Open Meetings Law. Rather than publicly owning your mistakes, you moved to go to trial and the judge found that directors Mike Peterson, Christy Williams, Becky Myers, and Kaylee Weingar broke Colorado Open Meetings Law. You have a policy that states the Board of Education and all district employees are good stewards of the financial resources belonging to the district on behalf of students and taxpayers. This board does not have a monitoring report for their own spending, but you require this of district staff. You are currently asking voters for more funding through an MLO and bond when the board is not being transparent with the public on exactly how much their actions are costing taxpayers financially. Hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent by you is not being properly monitored. Furthermore, when board treasurer Kaylee Weingard was questioned on the George Brockler show in May, she flat out denied that unused funds from legal budget to be redistributed to students and teachers. Director Weingar acknowledged in this interview that the school district's attorney advised the defendants in the lawsuit on what actions would cost the district less money, but you chose to reject the settlement offer in May rather than admit wrongdoing. She and other defendants disagreed with the 31 word statement where they would have admitted that their actions were wrong when they broke the open meetings law. The public deserves to know exactly how much in total this lawsuit has cost taxpayers from start to finish, beginning with Will Trackman, working with Holland Evans, and then Gessler Blue LLC, and now the resolution before you tonight remaining. in consideration of the plaintiff's fees who won in this lawsuit. Show us all of the receipts. Former Director Elizabeth Hansen estimated that total fees would be around half a million dollars. Meanwhile, teachers are talking about broken toilets and ceiling grip. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Uh, Chad Cox, Jen Iverson, followed by Mary Beth Tullis. Mr. Cox. Mr. Blair, do we have Mr. Cox online? Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. I'd like to start off by thanking directors Meek and Ray for their consistent, unwavering hard work and their constant leadership to our schools, students, and teachers. It is not always easy being the only adult in the room, but we honor all that you do to maintain the oversight into the actions or inactions of the majority board members, especially when those actions are unsavory or even unlawful in some instances. I imagine it must be a full-time job for the two of you. Speaking of unlawful actions, I'd like to talk about the ruling on the, com on the Colorado Open Meetings Law and the settlement being voted on tonight. Let's be honest with this settlement. In reading it, it's merely a joke. Take, for instance, statement three. Whereas you only state the judge stated the law in fact. Let me break that down for you, four board members. You're guilty. All that's being asked of you is to admit your guilt. That would have been easier than trying to cough up $103,000, $103,000, that could have easily gone towards our schools and our students and our teachers. Instead, this has been beat around the proverbial bush. It's like a game of the monkey chasing the weasels, except for in this case, we have four weasels. And the monkey has beat the weasels to death, but they're not going to admit their wrongdoing. Did you or did you not run on statements of accountability, honesty, humility? Are we missing that somewhere? Do you guys need a redefinition of humility, honesty, and accountability? Or does accountability and humility only work for those when it's not applied directly to you? 
The fact of the matter is, and everybody in our district needs to know this, you were found guilty for violating Colorado open meeting laws. In addition to only wanting to pay the legal fees of Mr. Marshall and refusing to and go into a, an appeal process if he doesn't accept your settlement is an absolute ridiculous ask. I don't expect him to accept your settlement if you don't admit to your own guilt. Accept your accountability, be honest, and be humble to the district, to the teachers, and to the students. It is, after all, something that we expect of our, of our children to admit when you're wrong. 15 it's seconds the basis, remaining. The core of what I teach my children. What am I teaching my children when adults in the room can't do the same thing? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Jennifer Iverson, followed by Mary Beth Tullis. Okay, at this point, we will take a... Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Wenju has withdrawn. Um, at this point, we'll take a 15-minute recess and reconvene at 6.15. Thank you.
Board of Education will come back into order. We are now on item number 11, adoption of consent agenda staff recommendations detailed in agenda items number 12 through 18, organized for the Board of Education block approval. Do we have a motion concerning consent? I'd like to remove item number 13 and for further discussion, but I would go ahead, if there's, unless there's others that want to remove something from consent, I will make a motion to adopt items 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 of the consent agenda. We have a motion by Ray to adopt items number 12 and 14 through 18. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Ray, second by Williams. I will take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Okay, we will now take up uh, item number 13, approval of superintendent contract updates. Director Ray? Thank you. Um, I don't know if we can put that attachment up on the screen, Director Peterson. Yeah, Mr. Blair, if you can pull up the attachment from item number 13. So um, I discussed this at our board retreat, but I wanted just to reiterate some concerns. I think, I think tonight's theme, it seems like, is what has been learned and how do we respond to this new learning? And so I think this is an item that I feel like um, is some new learning that we have and that we can respond to. And, and I want to just preface this by saying that my concerns in some of this language has nothing to do with Superintendent Kane's performance. Um, this language that I'm going to recommend, I would recommend regardless of who is in the superintendent's seat. As I shared with you at the board retreat, I'm very concerned that we don't have a requirement for a mid-year review. Um, and for many reasons, you know, certainly it's not uncommon in our other employee groups to have mid-year reviews. As a, as a matter of fact, if you go to our website and look at under evaluation, you'll see goal setting, mid-year review, final evaluation specified. Um, you'll even see on our website under evaluation, the purpose of mid-year review is this. Um, our, goal, uh, our goals in the process is for employees and their evaluators to be in continual contact about their performance. Mid-year evaluations provide an opportunity for employees to get some formal feedback and guidance to ensure they reach goals and performance expectations by the end of the school year and final evaluations. Um, given what happened, and this is the, the theme of what have we learned. So given what happened with former Superintendent Wise, where he was blindsided with performance concerns after the fact, I have to believe that had we had a mid-year review in place that we could have saved the district hundreds of thousands of dollars in lawsuits because we would have had that point in time where the four of you who had performance concerns could have communicated that. And I understand that it's optional. I understand that each of us as individual directors can certainly communicate to our superintendent if we have concerns. But that's different than the seven of us having that time with our one employee to give input and feedback at the midpoint to say, how are things going? It doesn't need to be the full-blown evaluation um, that we do at the end of the year, but I just think it's prudent that we never have a situation in the future where we blindside our superintendent with performance concerns because we've omitted an opportunity to do the mid-year review with our superintendent. Um, I'm going to just pass out um, something real quick. This is uh, just some notes for you. Um, one, the first paragraph is just a replication of what you see on the screen. 
But what isn't on the screen is that there's also a clause in the superintendent's contract that also says that in the event that the board determines that the performance of the superintendent is unsatisfactory in any respect, the board shall describe in writing in reasonable detail specific instances of unsatisfactory performance. The reason I printed that is we have this statement that says that we need to, again, formalize that when we have performance concerns, but we have no pathway to get there. Uh, we don't have a check-in where we can come together and say, do we have concerns? Or the superintendent can certainly say, making progress towards my goals as I uh, anticipated, and we move on. Um, so I, I, I'm very, very concerned that we haven't learned anything from our previous debacle with our former superintendent that cost our district thousands and thousands of dollars. And I believe this is one way not only to protect our system from something like that happening again, but it's really a protection for our superintendent. It really says to our superintendent at that mid-year point, if we have performance concerns, those will be communicated to her then, um, and so that she also has a chance to either rectify or change course or adjust. And so it's not just protecting the system, it's also protecting our one employee. So my proposed amendment to the timelines that are bolded in this particular clause in the contract is that a meeting between the board and superintendent during February of each contract year to review the superintendent's progress on goals and objectives and or to identify performance concerns, that that would be inserted. What I'm also showing you where it says previous superintendent's contract is that was certainly in the previous superintendent's contract. And I'm not sure where in the process that got omitted from that template, but it was certainly there prior to the contract that we drew up with uh, Superintendent Kane. On the back of my notes is just showing you then kind of the timelines that we currently have with other um, employee groups. Um, our classified administrative pro tech evaluation, you can see there that they actually have designated timelines that say that a mid-year evaluation meeting is due by such and such time. Obviously the other employee groups, that's optional, but I think again given what happened in the past, given that I think as a board we need to never again blindside our one employee the way we did with our former superintendent, I just feel like this is a safeguard that ought to be put in and I think it would be helpful for the communication um, for all of us in terms of making sure that we're all on the same page with our superintendent. So that's, that's the proposed amendment I'd like to make um, I'm willing to make a motion with that proposed amendment, but I will pause and just offer any questions or discussion. Yeah, I'd like to actually get the superintendent's input because any contract <clears throat> modifications that we make will have to be done jointly between the board and the superintendent. Thank you for the question. Um, my input would be that in the system, as Director Ray mentioned, those are um, tools that are available to us and they are optional. Um, so there isn't a um, forced mid-year review. It's, it's just if there is a reason to have one, you are welcome to have one, um, w which is an approach. That's the approach that we use in the system. Um, I have no objection to talking about performance any time, but my one concern would be that our board calendar gets very, very busy. And, and last year, it was a struggle to just get the... Um, uh, the review scheduled in time. In fact, you all had to make an exception to the dates in the um, contract in order to do that. So um, I also would hate to put in enough rope to hang everybody. So, um, you know, maybe consider making it optional as a tool as it is in our system. But um, that would be that would be my input. Thanks for asking. Well, thank you, Superintendent. Other directors, questions, comments? Uh, Director Williams and back to Director Ray. I'm a fan of making it optional, but I also think it's partly because with the um, in reinstated monitoring reports, we do have a lot of time throughout the year to be talking about the areas of focus. And so 
um, I think that that's that we are utilizing those sorts of things every month anyway. Director Ray. Just a follow up to Superintendent Kane. So my understanding though, Superintendent Kane, is that the classified administrator pro tech evaluation is not optional. Uh, because according to this timeline, it's, it specifically says things are due where the site evaluation and the lead evaluation has is optional. So just wondering, this is off our website, so I'm just trying to understand if that's not correct. Appreciate that. Then we clearly need to update our website because it is indeed, a mid-year is indeed optional. For even the classified correct. administrative and protect. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And I would just reiterate that I think, um, again, this is not the kind of evaluation that we do at the end of the year. And I certainly support the later uh, time to do that because of the monitoring reports. But I think it's just important that this is a check-in because no one director can give the superintendent um, direction. It has to really be from all of us. And, and so I think that puts her in an awkward position. If one board director has performance concerns, how does she react and respond to that if other directors don't share that same concern? And I think, that, again, I would just reiterate, this is um, due to, to me, the previous debacle that we had happened to our former superintendent. I believe we need to put a safeguard in place so it doesn't happen again. Other directors? Um, Superintendent Kane. Um, to Director Ray's point, perhaps um, some language around the um, Board of Education or the superintendent can initiate, has the ability to initiate a mid-year check-in. That kind of language would be um, fine with me, if that's helpful at all. Thank you. Director Meek. So f first, thank you, Director Ray, for reflecting back on you know, what we've been through as a board. Um, I, I honestly think it does need to be in the contract so it happens because we're seven individuals and the seven of us um, need to decide whether or not we want to do this. And it is a best practice in the field to meet with your superintendent, especially in the first few years of a superintendency. It's definitely a best practice because it allows the superintendent to have all seven provide that guidance and feedback. And it's challenging sometimes to have seven people come together <laughs> and give direction, but that's what this force is. Like, if there's one board member who is saying, I am not happy with the communication we're getting, it allows all seven to open up and really talk about, well, what should it look like? Is it appropriate? Is it not appropriate? It allows you to work through issues before you get to the end of the year. And it actually would save time for that end of the year evaluation because it forces you to have some of those conversations up front and resolve issues before you get to the end. So I am definitely in favor of adding this, especially because it is language in prior contracts that we have used. So there's precedent to that. And I, I mean, I agree, you know, the superintendent deserves to understand if they have, if there are performance concerns by board members. I mean, I'm not sure why that would be controversial. And with Superintendent Wise, you know, he, there was not one board conversation among the seven of us before he, he was let go. And that is why we've accrued um, legal costs in that decision. And so I, I am very much in favor of adding this contract language. Other directors? Yeah, I actually think that this is a good safeguard. The one uh, friendly amendment, if I make, I know it's not a, a formal motion, um, maybe to, to split the line, um, a meeting between the board and superintendent during February of each contract year to review the superintendent's progress on goals and objectives and or to identify performance concerns and then just insert if requested by one or more directors or the superintendent. That would make it optional, but if any, if any one board member, back to Director Meek's comments, if any one board member had a concern or the superintendent had a concern around monitoring any one of the seven board members 
or the superintendent could request that. And if we made that change in the contract, it would have to be appear on the agenda for one of the February meetings. If everything were going smoothly and can't, you know there were no inputs and each director in their one-on-one -on -one feedback and everything were going fine, there would not be a requirement in that year if that would be appropriate to kind of, I think that would provide the check and balance that, that I'm hearing from the other comments, but also not make it such a hard requirement where if there are other priorities and, and things were going smoothly, it would not be mandatory. Um, Director Ray, your comments on that since you yeah. proposed it? Yeah, I'm processing that a little bit. I mean, I, I understand that, and um, I think, I mean, that, that does feel like that safeguard still is in place if one director mm -hmm. makes that request. Um, it just... It just seems to me, and, and you all, everybody spoke to this, and Superintendent Kane spoke to this, that, that things get so busy that sometimes things f get lost. Yeah. And to me, if you have, the, if it's not optional, if we know that in February we've got a designated date where we just check in, and and it may be just a you know 10 minute exec session check in to say, hey, how are we doing? Everything's fine. We're all <laughs> feeling good, and we move on. But I feel like when we make it optional then it, uh, several things happen. One, it, it puts you know, one director in the spotlight to have to make that decision, you know, and then it gets into that uh, back and forth, and then it's how do you find the time now, because the director's saying, you know what, in January I want to get it together to talk about this, and then we're already booked up. So I'm, I'm processing away from the option, just because I feel like this would force us to actually put a date on the calendar, just like we do with our monitoring reports, where we say, by such and such date, we're going to monitor this board end. And I think we should do that with a review, uh, a mid-year review, just like we, like is posted on our website, where it says by January 13th, um, we would do a mid-year review for these, uh, for employees. So. I'm struggling, to be honest with you. I, I appreciate the, trying to amend it to, to where it's um, not rigid, but I, I guess I feel like it has to be um, really pointed that we designate this date, and if we decide you know, we don't need it, then I think the board can vote and say, you know what, everything's good, and we move on. So that's kind of where I'm at. Director Williams. I think I could get behind uh, putting a date on it if we didn't have to go through the full review. So if it was, yeah. in fact, just truly a check-in, and I feel like I don't know how to change the the verbiage, but I just I felt like this was like going to be the same um, yeah. the same discussion as we have in June. So if there was a way to make it that it was just truly a check-in where we all you know, going to executive session, if that's what Superintendent Kane wants to do, um, then it could be a 10 minute discussion as you presented instead of making it a full like three hour. If, if I may, Director Ray, and I, I could also buy on to that if we want to make it a hard schedule. And I, you know, I'm trying to balance the two. Maybe if we said uh, during February of each year to discuss the superintendent's performance and just leave it as that because otherwise it sounds like we're going through the goals, the objectives. I mean, basically duplicating, as Director Williams said, the uh, the uh, summary review that we conduct in June. So if we just change the language to, you know, not making it optional, but a meeting between the board and superintendent during February of each contract year to discuss the superintendent's performance. And that way it we're not so rigid in how we have to conduct that discussion. Would that yeah. meet your? Yeah, that, okay. that would. So if you're OK, I, I would like, I'll go ahead and make a motion unless there's other directors that want to contribute other, Any to that. other directors, questions, comments? Uh, Director Myers. I'm just asking, are we leaving out then the if requested by the, we would leave out that yeah. and just OK? C correct. OK. Go ahead, Director Ray. Oh, Sorry, go ahead, Director Ray. So I make a motion that we amend the proposed changes to the superint uh, superintendent contract to insert the following words. A meeting between the board and superintendent during February of each contract year to discuss the superintendent's performance and or identify performance concerns. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Ray and a second by Meek. 
And just for clarity, if you don't mind, I'll read the entire 6.1 for anybody listening at home and for Ron A. So the proposed changes would be to section 6.1 of the superintendent contract and would need to be voted upon by a majority of the board and agreed to by the superintendent since it's the contract. Uh, 6.1 revision would read as follows. Uh, the board shall evaluate and assess in writing the performance of the superintendent at least once during the term of this contract during each school year in which this contract continues. The evaluation assessment shall be based upon the superintendent's job description and upon any goals and objectives with performance standards as agreed by the board and the superintendent. At a minimum, this evaluation shall include a meeting between superintendent and the board um, no later than October 31st of each year of this contract to conduct the formative part of the evaluation, a meeting between the board and superintendent during February of each contract year to discuss superintendent's performance and or to identify performance concerns, and a meeting no later than June 30 of each year to conduct the summative evaluation. Did I get that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the proposed uh, language just for everyone, the entirety of it. Uh, motion by Ray, second by Meek. Any other discussion before votes? Okay, seeing none, I will take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. We passed seven to zero. And we'll now move to the next item, which is the approval of minutes. The recommendation is the Board of Education approves the August 22nd, 2023 and September 12th, 2023 board minutes as presented. Do I have a motion to approve the August 22nd and September 12th minutes as presented? So moved. Motion by Myers. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ray. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Moving on to item number 20, Colorado Measures of Academic Success, also known as CMAS data presentation. We have a 10-minute presentation followed by a 10-minute Q&A. Good evening. Uh, thank you, board directors, uh, for giving me the opportunity to share some results with you tonight. Um, I've actually expanded this beyond just CMAS to look at the high school assessments as well. Uh, those were also released uh, about the same time. You can see the system uh, of what grade levels are assessed on which assessment, uh, whether it's CMAS, uh, ELA, Math, Science, or PSAT and SAT. Um, a few uh, pieces of context. This data is a little bit different than what's reported on a performance framework. The performance framework's looking at average scores. Here we're looking at proficiency levels. Um, and that language is really important, um, knowing that we're looking at uh, students that meet or exceed expectations. Um, in other words, we're looking directly at how students are performing against the standards. It's not how students are reading and writing or doing math, it's how they're um, working on the standards. That's really important context here. Uh, here is a summary um, of our performance uh, for ELA from grades three through eight as compared to the state. Uh, the bar graphs show our performance against the state and then the line graph shows our participation. Uh, we do monitor our participation. It's something that we're keenly aware of. The further and further you get away from 100 to 90 percent of your students taking the test, it becomes more and more difficult for you to draw conclusions. And so we do monitor that as part of our experience. Uh, you can see across the board, uh, we continue to outperform the state. Um, this is our math performance, again, the same color hues. Um, again, uh, we're the green, the state is the red, and we also have participation. Very similar slope with the participation. Uh, we do see slight variations between the participation, um, just given how the tests are administered. But again, you can see that our performance um, is above the state. Um, and I want to provide some context. Um, so the last couple of times that uh, we presented information, if you recall back in 2021, they only administered select assessments to select grade levels. And so it's become really interesting for us to look at our trend. 
one, that we're missing 2020, and two, you've got 2021 that's only in certain grade levels. So um, I'm capturing that here with ELA being the odd, and you can see the stair stepper, which we love to see in data, uh, that at, over time we continue to increase the, the percentage of students that are proficient um, each year as we do that stair stepper. So you can almost draw a line down the middle of those bar graphs because that's the year 2020 um, in the middle. Um, also, we do look at uh, performance of our uh, subgroup populations over that time as well. Uh, again, we like to see the stair stepper, um, the, the idea that you continue to improve performance over time. Um, and again, right in the middle of that, you can see 2021. Um, and I will click on the next one here. Uh, this is the same data set. Again, this is fifth grade. Uh, fifth grade was selected because it was right in the middle of what um, assessments were chosen for 2021 that allows us to see that trend data. Um, and you can see that our populations, our subpopulations, mirror what we see overall, which is exactly what you want to see. Um, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt and myself were just talking about this, uh, where another deputy superintendent from another large uh, area school district was asking us questions about this. How do we get this? How do we get this picture of um, our subgroup performance performing in the same way that we're getting overall, especially in the context? So it's always nice uh, for our other districts to reach out for some advice um, and to be acknowledged by our other districts. Um, this is the same data for math. Uh, you can see with math, there's more variations in here um, in terms of the, the interruption to instruction. We have known this. This is something that we have talked about here, that that interruption to instruction was a very big deal. But what you can see is right in the middle, after 2020, you can see the stair stepper start again, uh, which is a really nice thing for us to see over time, that you're getting uh, better performance over time. Um, again, this is sixth grade. Again, it's right in the middle of that snapshot to look at subgroup performance. Um, again, we want to see that t continual progression of increased performance among our subgroups. And this is the other two subgroups, uh, minorities and students with disabilities. You'd love to see uh, two things, one that stair stepper, and also you'd love to see higher bars. So it is nice to admire that we're in growing, but also you project out forward that we have a lot of work to do. And so this is a nice snapshot of being able to show that. Um, this is our participation over time. Um, in many cases, we've been able to recover uh, from the idea of participation. Um, that has been very challenging for us to re-engage parents and students in the idea of participating in tests. In most grade levels, uh, we have been able to recover from that, which is a, a big celebration because uh, we do appreciate and we value the data from our students. And so it's nice to see the participations start uh, to rebound. Uh, this is another snapshot. Uh, we always look to see what our competitors are doing, um, not only with uh, our hiring, but also in our performance data. Uh, we are the, the green uh, graph there. Um, I always like it when we're longer than the rest of them. Um, in cases where we're not, I always ask lots of pointed questions. Um, so you can see what our performance is. And that actually clusters our grade levels together. Um, so that you can see an elementary snapshot and then a middle snapshot as well. Um, this is the same competitive uh, data call it comparative. Um, I like to see the green graphs uh, that are longer than the others as well. And where it doesn't happen, we always have questions um, and things to consider. Uh, turning our attention to growth, the growth data was also something that was released. Um, this is uh, measured against the Colorado growth model. Um, again, it's students versus students. It's how students compare to their academic peers. So like score testers are compared to like score testers. Um, in this case, we always want to be above 50. Uh, 50 is the state's benchmark for what uh, is deemed uh, meeting the state standards. So anytime as a large organization we can see that number being above 50, that's great. Uh, mathematically, the more data points you get, the more and more you tend to regress to that median value of 50. So anytime you're above that 50 is a celebration. So this is ELA um, over time. You'll notice that third grade is not included in this because they don't have a score history to compare to. Uh, so the data set is smaller here because you're looking at um, a truncated data set. Uh, this is your median growth percentiles for math. Again, that benchmark is 50. We want to be above 50 in all of our categories. We do have two grade levels in this case that just me miss that mark of, uh, at 48. Um, again, anytime I see something that's outside of what the expectations are, we do ask some questions um, about what's happening uh, at those particular grade levels. Turning our attention to high school. 
Um, high school's uh, state assessment system is a little bit different. It's based on College Board. Um, it builds on top of each other from their suite of assessments from PSAT 8, 9, 10, and then SAT. So it's 9th grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade. Um, and not only does it build, but the score actually shifts. So as students move and progress, that score shifts. So as you interpret the scores, you have to think about that, that the benchmark that happens at PSAT 8-9 is lower than SAT because the whole thing shifts. The idea here is uh, students who are in ninth grade have not been exposed to all the content yet. So they slide that scale to keep the same width of the scale and they move those proficiency levels. So uh, let's look at participation. Uh, this is one that uh, we're really happy with, uh, that when we look at mean scale score and participation, you can see our mean scale score, again, is above the state. And in this case, our participation is above the state, which is something we're really, really happy about. Um, we're happy that uh, our kids are really engaged in this assessment. Um, looking at over time, uh, you can see the, the number of test takers and you can see that decline that happened right around 2020, uh, which matches up to our decline in enrollment. Um, the second thing you'll notice is we haven't quite come back to what our previous participation was before 2020. We haven't quite caught up. Um, and that's caused us to, to look at this data a little bit different. Uh, we would want that participation up to be 95%, uh, but we haven't quite got there and you can see our PSAT uh, 9 is at 86 uh, percent. We're a little ways away from that 95 percent and so that's a conversation that we're having right now is how can we get more kids engaged in that um, assessment. Um, in terms of scoring, uh, this is a snapshot of scoring between PSAT 8, 9, PSAT 10, and SAT. You can see the bars are growing, which is exactly what we'd want from each assessment. Um, if you look across, you do see there's movement in the bars. Sometimes we're above, sometimes we're below. There's some general trends. Uh, we see, uh, especially in SAT, there's been a dip in our performance the last couple years. Um, we see that with participation. We see that with our performance. And so part of our conversation right now with high school leaders um, is looking at that data to see if we can increase that participation and also look at the data too. Um, we are, although we have lots to celebrate, we're not immune to interruptions in learning, um, interruptions in, in instruction. And so that's also a conversation that we're having uh, with our school leaders. Another thing that we're noticing, especially in SAT, is the number of students that we have at risk in our district has increased. We've expanded our alternative education campus enrollment. And so thinking about that in, in regards to our performance is something that uh, we're also thinking about. Um, this is breaking down each test separately. So you can see the evidence-based reading and writing. You can see um, our mean math score and the total against our competitors. Again, we're the green bar. Um, ideally, we'd love to be number one. Um, and so we'll continue to strive to make gains in this area to become number one. Uh, this is PSAT 10. Again, looking at the same subscores. Again, we're green, um, and you can see that uh, we're not quite number one yet. And I say yet because that's something that we aspire to and we're going to be working very diligently on. Uh, this is also a, a snapshot against the competitors, um, and it looks at the, beans, the mean score against the subscores and also the total. Something that we started tracking several years ago um, started back in 2017 is when the state required that we have graduation competencies added to um, a graduation requirement, we started monitoring this data set. Um, it's been a very interesting data set to monitor and you can ask any high school um, on the links that they go through to monitor this data set. Um, it is an interesting data set to look at because it's very fluid in terms of looking at pulling in this data. Um, we get SAT scores all year round. Students are taking this test on Saturdays as well as in schools. And so looking at this data set, it's not just the single day administration that our schools look at, it's all of the SAT scores that are um, in, in our system. You can see in the last year, we, we had an increase in the competencies for both math and for both ELA. 
We like to see that trend continue to have more and more students demonstrate competency in SAT. So we want an increase in mean scale score, increase of competence, and also an increase in participation. Those are things that we do aspire to. Um, always being the competitor, um, this information is out. Um, this is the preliminary performance frameworks between us against the same folks that I've been talking about earlier. Uh, we, again, are the green uh, bar. And the dash line is 74, which is that cut score to get us to accredited with distinction. It's something that we pay close attention to. We're sitting at 72.4%. Uh, we are inching closer and closer. Again, goes back to the previous data that I showed, um, an area of focus for us. We really want to get back to our students fully participating in that test so that we can truly see uh, where our overall performance would be. So we're really, really happy with that. Um, I have questions as a slide, but I also appended um, some other things on the back just in case there were some questions last year. So I re-ran the data so that you have access to it to be able to look at some of that as a desegregation. Uh, but I'm going to stop there, um, take a breath, and allow you to ask some questions. Directors, sorry. Directors comments, questions? I'll start off with just a general one, Mr. Reynolds. So it looks like on CMAS, we fall below participation-wise, but below the rest of the state. Yet on SAT, PSAT, we're slightly above. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of, to use Director Ray's term, a lot of wonderings about, about why just a general observation that families don't seem to value the CMAS, yet they still value PSAT. I'm wondering, are we doing too well in CTE? And uh, maybe our students are seeing that pathway is not necessary to have to do P, you know, PSAT, SAT. Is it staff turn turnover? What are, what are some of the areas that you're looking into to, and the superintendent to promote that te test participation increase in both areas. Well, and, and I'm sure um, Superintendent Kane will want to weigh in. Um, but I, I have a few things that uh, just based on conversations with parents, with schools, school accountability committees, um, the general trend is as you increase in grade level, the participation decreases until they hit high school. Um, and the high school test many times it's more meaningful to them because it's associated with college entrance historically. And so you see the increase because they want to prepare themselves for the SAT as well as the PSAT for national merit. There's a lot of money that's associated with scholarships there. So there is added incentive for them to participate. In terms of CMAS, it's well within a parent's right to excuse their child. And so it really comes down to that individual conversation Middle school, uh, middle school, and I, and I have a middle schooler at home, um, they do uh, lots of pressuring of their parents in terms of being able to participate and not participate. Uh, we have seen that. Um, where we do see success in our system with schools who remain relatively unscathed with this participation and parent excusals is they do a, a, an effort to be able to promote that as something that's a value add to their system. Um, and we have, you know, middle schools that they're above 90% and we have some that are in the 60s. The, by and large, the schools that promote and they have a climate and culture within their community that this is a value data point, it's not really an issue. Um, there are school communities where, uh, you know, it's just a thing. And so it, it's peeling back that and having those conversations and explaining to parents that this data really matters. It, you know, in situations where you have a 60% participation rate, we get these ratings back from the state on performance framework. Those are set in stone. And so, but parents look at that. And that data also feeds into other things like School Digger and all these other websites. So sometimes parents don't appreciate or understand that that data matters to our school from a public appearance and, more importantly, for what they can do with the data internally. I don't know if there's anything. Yes, I would, uh, I would agree with Mr. Reynolds. Um, we do work with our schools and will continue to do so to make a concerted effort to just have conversations with parents about 
um, state testing and, and why it's important, what it means to them as a parent and how they are able to review their child's um, results with their teacher or even just independently to be able to see what their child um, can do and know. Um, we also, of course, as, as uh, Mr. Reynolds said, we also know that it feeds into our district's reputation, but, but also our, our efforts for improvement. While it's still, um, the delayed results make it really hard to react individual and ind to individual, it still informs us of if we need to take a look at curriculum or if we need to take a look at uh, a skill that somehow got missed in a given year or whatever it is, it gives us areas of focus which only make our school system better. Um, so I agree with Mr. Reynolds that the, con the schools that have conversations with their families make a huge difference. Um, and in fact, the system that, that I ran um, got over 95% participation from about 80 um, six or seven years ago. And really, it was just consistent conversations. And the last thing I would say is middle school's tough. You can picture your eighth grader coming home and saying, but mom, I'm literally the only one that has to take the test, which of course is not true, but um, I certainly had a canned response for my kids, which went something like, suck it up. Um, but anyway, um, but anyway, that's, you know, it's just that culture as, as Mr. Reynolds said. So thank you for the question. Maybe some creative community service for those that opt out on that day. Um, any other directors? Director Meek. Uh, on the same topic, so when I was chair of the Thunder Ridge High School SAC, right, that was the height of the opt-out movement. And so I think we've been improving, you know, over the years, but I wonder if there is a short video that maybe could be created that could be shown at the SAC meetings, right? And it could be shown or sent out in newsletters, Mr. Reynolds, you're everywhere but you can't be everywhere all the time. So maybe just a little video might be really, really helpful. But I remember, you know, it was very effective to talk about it during the SAC meeting and to explain why it was so important. So that's just one idea. And then um, I think maybe I know you and maybe that's why the next slides are in here that we didn't have a chance to go through. But I, I do think it would be, this was my question. And so if you could spend a few minutes, since we're ahead of time, on some of these slides, I do think our community would find it helpful. Um, absolutely. Um, so on these additional slides is, is taking a look at not just um, the desegregated groups, but also looking at the de desegregated groups in comparison to our competitors. Um, sometimes we live in a vacuum of looking at our own performance and seeing great performance or not great performance and we wonder what our neighbors are doing. So um, sticking with the same subject and grade level, um, again, we're the green bar. Um, I wanted to look to see how we're doing in comparison to other districts in these same subgroup categories. And you can see uh, within these two, which are multilingual learners and also free and reduced lunch, we're at the top of that scale. I'm always glad to see that. Um, and the next one is uh, minority and, and students with disability, um, which is great, um, which is why uh, we have people reaching out to say, well, what are you doing different in, in Douglas County? And what are some things that we can do in order to increase our performance um, and mirror some of the work that you've done? Um, also did that for mathematics. Again, we're, we're the green bar. Um, this is multilingual learners and as free and reduced lunch. Again, we're at the top of that scale, which is always nice. Um, and this is minority and students with disabilities. We missed out on the one, which um, is something that uh, we're, we're diving into uh, anytime that we're not at the top. Um, but it's always nice to see in comparison to other districts how we're performing. Um, I took a same perspective with um, SAT and look at our subgroups, our internal subgroup performance over time to see how that trend aligns with what we're seeing overall. Very similar, um, very similar we're seeing um, in the last year or so, we want to increase the, the mean scale score for not only our overall, but also for uh, these subgroups. Um, and we see some, like the minority score is similar, the same. I always like to see um, us climb stairs to greater heights. And so I like to see these uh, bars to go up. And so it's part of our conversation now. It's 
not just a universal conversation, but also when we look at our desegregated subgroups, where are some opportunities for us to do some additional work um, and maybe uh, some additional strategies to engage? So, thank you. Director Ray. Just a follow up to that, Mr. Reynolds. Um, so I understand we're, when we're doing the comparison, we're using percentages. Um, is there, would the, is there, it, I can't think of how to word this, statistically, if you're a school district like DPS that has a much higher percentage of multilingual learners, statistically, wouldn't we expect that district to not perform as well as us that has fewer multilingual lingual learners? Or do you think the percentages truly are genuine until how we compare population to population? Um, very interesting and loaded question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> know that there's many factors that go into performance. Um, and certainly, when you look at the segregated groups that are specifically identified on both the state and federal accountability systems, they're identified for a reason. They're, they're identified because historically, these groups have underperformed. I mean, this goes way back to Ch No Child Left Behind, where you're identifying subgroups to increase performance. So if you have a larger population in certain groups, you would expect to see a higher impact, which is part of the challenge that we have with the, the state's accountability system, because you're being double counted right. um, in that realm. Um, but it's not just about the demographics. There's other things that go into it. Certainly, socioeconomic status is something that plays a role in every piece of data that I show you. Um, there, there's a certain amount of, of things that play a role. Uh, we also have an impact on what we do as an organization in terms of what our focus areas are. So not really directly answering your question, yeah, but just providing some of the context. Yeah, that's helpful. So just a couple other questions. One is so you are also advocating that we should have a higher percentage rate with SAT. Is that correct? Yes. And help me understand that because I, 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 am I correct to understand that our graduation requires SAT? Is that right? And for graduation competency? So we have a full menu of options for graduation competencies, and SAT is just one. Right. So we have certificates, we have concurrent enrollment, we have other avenues, other assessments that play at role here. This is the one that we look at universally based on the number of students that take it. The other options, not all of our students take advantage of those. So not all of our students take an ASVAB or do an ACT work keys or any of the other menu. This one gives us a more global picture of our student performance because we have more students participating. So if we have students that, I mean, so in your participation percentages, the assumption is that those students that didn't participate in SAT took some other pathway to demonstrate graduation competency, is that correct? Yes, and that's why when, when I look back at this data, uh, when I refer to it as a very fluid data set, this only represents one of the menu of options. And so our principals and their staff and counselors, as they're monitoring their graduation, they monitor the whole menu to ensure that students have opportunities, plural, to be able to demonstrate competence. And so this only represents a snapshot of one of those options, but our schools do a wonderful job of tracking students and looking for opportunities for those students to demonstrate competence. Director Meek. I notice we don't disaggregate looking at Boulder. Is that intentional not to include Boulder, or am I missing? So I stick to uh, the same desegregated groups that we look for for employment. Okay. So when, when we're competing with folks for our staffing, I use the same competition. It's a data set that I would be more than happy to run if there's a curiosity, but I typically look at our competitors for employment. Right. Well, I, I kind of think of Littleton and Boulder as kind of being our competitors around academics mostly. but. Particularly, I was looking at the English language arts, ELA, and we hear a lot of public comment around dyslexia. And I know Boulder, I believe, did universal testing with dyslexia. So I'm just curious. I think that would be an interesting data set to take a look at and see how we compare against Boulder. And um, I don't know if you have anything that you would want to add around dyslexia given some of the public comments that we heard and I don't want to put you on the spot if, if you don't but 
No, I, I would be more than happy to share data against Boulder just based on our data is really good. Um, so I would be more than happy to generate that data uh, to look uh, against. Um, and there are conversations, and the caller tonight was, was spot on. There, there are conversations to be had regarding the REDACT um, in regards to what's the intended outcome for the REDACT. And certainly dyslexia pay, plays a role in that. Um, they perform their own state level evaluation. Um, and that state level evaluation came back, and now the state board has to respond to that and think about how, in the future, they're going to look at the rules associated with the Colorado READ Act to see how they can incorporate the evaluation results from their third party evaluator. So uh, we're anxiously awaiting to see what the state does in terms of those requirements. Superintendent Kane. Thank you, President Peterson. Um, I have a number of comments based on some of the questions asked, so I will try to go through them. Um, one of the questions asked was, why is our um, participation in SAT um, becoming lower? And, and uh, Mr. Reynolds talked about a lot of those reasons. But the one that didn't come up is that we're finding that colleges value SAT less and less. So that gives students another reason to, to not potentially not take SAT. So that's one of the dynamics. Um, that our schools are struggling with. Also in terms of SAT, it's important to think about um, our AEC campuses. So we have a number of alternative education campuses, of course, including Eagle, Oaks, um, and Hope Online, which um, just added, I think, Mr. Reynolds, 800 high school students. Um, last year. So when we look at averages across our district, we're looking at those averages, um, of course, across our entire district. And with a, a change in AEC population of over 800 students in one year, um, that's going to have some kind of um, impact on our averages. So just something to keep in mind. And then lastly, um, regarding the accountability system and subgroups in the accountability system and Director Ray's comment about um, the district performance framework percentages and are those impacted by demographics. Um, as you know, I'm on the accountability task force and we had a meeting today, in fact, and this was a big topic of discussion today. And um, in addition to the statistical reasons that you and Mr. Reynolds discussed, Director Ray, um, you actually are correct, that does have a significant impact on their district performance framework because the way that the math currently works, if, the major if, if your overall population, if the majority of your overall population is one or more subgroups, then you end up getting double, triple, or quadruple penalized. So you are going to see a drastically lower DPF than if you were considering, say, gaps versus um, straight achievement of subgroups. So I think that was a really interesting point to make. Um, thank you. I think I covered all my points. Other directors? Uh, Director Williams. So just really quickly, um, I think Superintendent Kane might have answered my question. I, does this include charters as well? So yes. all the scores are, yep. that's all. Director Ray. So do, we, do colleges still do ACT in, in addition to SAT, or is that, or is that ACT wiped out completely? It, it depends on the university and college. Okay. And so that, that's a very active conversation. Um, ACT and SAT are not used by the same college at the same time. And even having an entrance or college exam, some schools are doing away with it totally. Um, okay. And so it just depends on the institution, okay. uh, which makes it really challenging for our, our parents to make those decisions right. uh, and our students as well. Yeah. I know I had a conversation with some students last night, or SAG, whatever night that was, um, but they were talking about wishing that they had more opportunities to take ACT as well as more opportunities to take SAT because I think they like to try to increase their scores. Yes. Um, so, so I know that that's another factor for them in terms of participation. But uh, one more wondering that I have. Um, back with the math, um, you, when you, the slide where you merged middle school math, grade six through eight. Yeah. And so I, mean, I think that slide stands out, obviously, and you mentioned it, uh, Mr. Reynolds, that we're not, the green isn't as, as tall as you'd like it. What I'm curious about, so that 
when you compare that slide then to the median growth percentiles, you see six, seven, and eight, especially six and seven, yes, knocking the socks off in terms of being above that 50th percentile. And so I'm curious how, why we see the median percentile growth looking good, and then we see the, the merge percentage uh, looking less than what we'd like. And then to follow up with that question then, is it eighth grade, is, is what's going on in eighth grade? Great, an opportunity for me to geek out on math. This is great. Um, so a couple of things. Um, this slide back here shows the percent of students that are proficient. Right. So it's how many are meeting or exceeding the, the state's expectation. The slide here shows how they're doing against their academic peers. So if they score low or high, they're being compared against students that score low or high. So they're looking at how they're performing against those that are in the same score bands, if you want to think of it that way. So it is possible to have low performance and really, really high growth. Gotcha. And they're, they're two separate things. Also, this data is truncated because the students have to have a score history. And so it's looking specifically at students over time that have a score history. The great news for us here is the ones that we do have data for are really outperforming their peers. Yeah. But we would like them to score better from a proficiency standpoint. Gotcha. So one's a celebration and one's more of a curiosity to how can we increase those scores. And so then is there a concern in eighth grade for some reason? When we, when we look at that their growth is below the 50th percentile, I, I understand that's over time, but is there, is there any thoughts about why we're seeing that? It's a Quick question that, that I'm currently uh, really embedded in. Um, it's looking at that performance over time to see is that an aberration or is this a trend for over time? And so looking at our seventh grade data, it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that, that that's going to be an aberration um, for long term. I think it's a one-time data set. But really to dive in there and, and see how are they performing. And then you also have to count participation in there as well to see um, what does that look like? Uh, one data point a trend does not make, and so we're going to be diving into it a little bit more and looking at some of the other data points that we have access to. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Kane. Um, and just to add a couple of things to that to answer your question, um, in addition to everything Mr. Reynolds said, growth is also, also often a leading indicator for achievement, right? If you have high growth, then so goes your achievement. So. Hopefully, the growth that we're seeing will um, make this achievement look even better next year, et cetera. Um, that was the first one. And I think I have, oh, the second one is, I'm not suggesting Mr. Reynolds is digging into eighth grade, and a lot of it is participation, because eighth grade tends to be our lowest. But that being said, Assistant Superintendent Windsor and his team, one of the things that they um, have been and are really looking at closely is the idea of algebra readiness um, and making sure that we're consistent across our district in terms of algebra readiness. So that is a real focus area for Assistant Superintendent Windsor and his team. Um, thank you. Well, one comment here, we had a public comment or talk about iReady and the, the pros and cons and things. Um, I find just more of a comment for folks here. These are all lagging indicators. We see what happened in the past. Um, and I just want to applaud you for that nice combination of the lagging CMAS standardized scores with the leading indicators on iReady. So when we see that early individual off track or not leaving up the standards, we can get those early interventions in there. So why iReady is not perfect, I'd like to continue the plug for leading indicators to complement these lagging indicators so we can really get in there for individual students. And hopefully that results in, in the higher growth and achievement that we're seeing in some of these slides. Any others? Director Meek. I mean, since you mentioned iReady, maybe it's worth, um, are we finding that there are student subgroups that iReady is really not working for? Um, I've heard some concerns brought forward around maybe students with dyslexia or other disabilities. Yeah, so one of the things that we're investigating um, is really looking at what's the multitude of data points that we can use to inform when we have conversations and look at student performance. Uh, there's no assessment that's perfect, um, and there's no assessment that does all things for all students. So really advocating for the idea of let's use multiple data points to be able to examine student performance. Um, it is an online test, and it's adaptable. 
Um, so with it being online and adaptable, you don't often get to see a student actually reading. Um, and so encouraging our schools to continue to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, everyone loves social media. Everybody loves to be online. But there's nothing that replaces that student to teacher interaction with being able to understand how a student performs. There's no data set that's going to replace that. And so part of our conversation is, what can we add to that data set to help people make those decisions and truly uncover what um, areas of focus or areas of need each student has? Just to follow up with that, uh, Ms. Reynolds, so, and I wholeheartedly agree with multiple data points in, in making decisions. I think, you know, as long as I can remember being on the board, we continue to have that notion of universal screening for dyslexia. And I think it's what Director Meek is getting at. Um, have, are we exploring anything of that nature? And can we talk about that? Yes, that's something that uh, we are exploring. Um, there have been certain pilots that have been done by the state. The state has done pilots in certain schools for us to be able to model from. We've had conversations with Boulder to see how they've um, not only implemented the first time, but also looking at over time. Is screening, when do you do it, is it sustainable, what do you do with that information? So yes, absolutely. Um, also, in, now that we have uh, universal pre-K, does that play a role in this conversation as well? So the introduction of universal pre-K could be another avenue for us to do some initial screening in addition to doing it K-12. Uh, Director Meek. I'll try to make this my last question. Um, you know, I appreciated you talking about the CMAS scores, the scores against the standards, right? And I think those standards are fairly aggressive standards. It's not what adults had as standards when they were in school. Um, do parents have an opportunity to take a CMAS test? I mean, it's, it's online, right? It's, it's going to be really, I think it would be very eye-opening. And so I don't know if that's a, an opportunity that's available. Yes. So the state has um, online versions of that test available on their website. Um, it's actually one of my favorite activities to do with staff and with parents. Um, these standards are uh, very rigorous standards. Um, and, and they are no joke um, in terms of what we're asking students to do. Third graders are asked to cite contextual evidence from multiple sources something that I did not do when I was in third grade. Um, and so looking at our performance, if we went back to the CSAP and TCAP days of just selecting an answer and only focusing in on fluency, you would see a massive difference in our test scores. But that's not what the standards are asking for. Um, I often get the question of, can we go back to basics? That's not going to get the job done in, in what our current world is. Um, the three R's for us now is rigor, relevance, and reasoning. Um, it's, it's the next level of trying to process information. For those parents that have tried to help their students with math, they understand what I'm talking about. It is a different expectation that we're holding our students to. Superintendent Kane. The other thing I would add about the standards, in addition to them being aggressive, um, keep in mind when the CMAS test is taken, which is April generally, Mr. Reynolds, is that correct? Yes. And what we are being tested against are aggressive standards that are end of year standards. So these kids have two months of instruction remaining, um, which is one of the reasons you see the variation from our iReady um, percent of kids on grade level and our CMAS percent of kids on grade level, because when we test them two thirds of the way through the year, a lot of them aren't quite there yet, but they absolutely will get there. All right, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. And we'll have you back for even more at a later date, I'm sure. All right, moving on to item number 21. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, are you, are you still going? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Reynolds. All right, consider this your later sorry. date. I just um, imagined a big hook coming out there, but go ahead. So while they're queuing up uh, the presentation, um, we come through a, a process each and every year where we present a draft of the Unified Improvement Plan for you all to adopt um, in alignment with the timelines that's set forth by the state. Um, in doing that, uh, we partner with our District Accountability Committee uh, in order to um, actually 
create, develop, and look at our data. Um, and we have two of those members with us uh, tonight, two of our officers. We've got uh, Lisa Loomer and Kelly Pointer, um, two of our officers here, to answer any questions about their involvement. Um, but I do want to say thank you um, to them uh, for, for not only being here, but also participating. I, I know uh, Director Page has participated. Director Meek has participated in uh, the data dialogues that we've had as part of it. So I just wanted to say thank you before we jumped in. Um, so the, the District Accountability Committee, very, very specific for them, uh, they have a, a responsibility to advise you all concerning the preparation and to submit recommendations regarding the contents of the plan. Uh, we partner with them, so rather than it be a separate event, we develop the plan alongside with them and, and their advisement and feedback along the way, um, which is a unique thing that we do as a district. Um, a few things before we get into the actual plan itself. Every year, uh, there are changes. Uh, there are changes to the assessments, the accountability rules, and what data we have available. This just summarizes some of the data uh, that we got and kind of the timeline at which we get it. Um, we get information really in August, and we turn that into updates to our plan for you all to be able to adopt so that we can get it into the state system by October 15th. Now, that doesn't end our story. We constantly get data throughout the year. Um, so this is a snapshot at the beginning of the year, but we'll get additional information mid-year regarding graduation, matriculation, um, dropout. We get data along the way that we get, we evaluate, and we dive into, um, and we incorporate that along the way. Um, some key changes. Um, now that we're coming out of the transitional phase with accountability, you'll no longer see that label on the performance frameworks. We're getting a more complete data set. We have one more year. Um, of data that's truncated. Uh, we'll have, next year we'll have a more complete data set because we'll have run multiple years away from a, a suspension on the testing. Um, the accountability clock resumes, that was suspended for several years. Um, and we also see the moniker of decrease due to participation when we don't capture parent excusals. Um, that's something that was returned. Um, you've got two separate laws. So the idea of a unified improvement plan it's unified because it speaks to both state and federal requirements. So we incorporate both state requirements and federal requirements. So we do have to address both. The federal government does not acknowledge parent excusals. That's something that they don't acknowledge. They, they hold you accountable to that 95%. And so on all performance frameworks, if you're below that 95%, they show that. Um, now with the state system, because they're acknowledging parent excusals, it's not part of our overall performance framework unless we don't document. Um, so our stools do a really, really good job of documenting. So we don't have that issue. They're able to capture 100% of their kids in most cases, either taking the test or parent excusals. Uh, we did get our ESSA identifications. That's something that was re resuming. Um, not too surprising. Our three alternative education campuses did get identified for targeted support from the federal government. By design, they're designed for at-risk students, so it's not something that is unexpected on our end. Um, here's a general timeline for the District Accountability Committee. Um, they have uh, a lot of activity and a lot of work for me at the very beginning of the year. Uh, we're talking about updates to accountability. Uh, we have a very in-depth work session uh, where we spend about two hours looking at our performance data. Uh, that year, uh, previous years, and we also look at the major themes within the contents of the plan itself. Um, the plan submission is due on October 15th. Considerations, uh, this is the context by which we design that plan. Uh, this is a, a list of a few things that we consider. We start with the board education goals, work to superintendent goals, and then there's a couple of different things that we have to consider just based on the context of that given year. Um, here are your goals. I guess I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. You guys know these. Um, here are the, the proposed goals at the time that I pulled this, but I believe you guys have landed on these. So these were incorporated as part of that process as well. So in, in terms of priority performance challenges, uh, you guys have seen some of the data uh, that we utilize in order to design our plan. Um, a few things that we have seen. Uh, while we continue to trend up and climb stairs to higher achievement, we do see legs between our subgroup performance and our overall. It's nice to see that when we move universal instruction in a positive way, you, you bring performance up, 
but we still have gaps, and that's something that we'll continue to work on. Um, graduation rates, again, that's something that we're keenly aware of, and we look for uh, specific subpopulations that may or may not be in line with the, the graduation rates of our full student body population. The other thing that is uh, a very unique thing is high school science. Um, high school science is a very, very unique thing. We're, we're held accountable to it. Um, that accountability starts next year, but our participation is just not very high. Um, we just acknowledge that it's not very high and we do our best to promote it, but parents and students make the decision on whether they participate in that. Uh, but it does reflect on our overall performance. So uh, looking at our root causes and, and diving into our root causes, um, many of these root causes we have talked about in this room for the last several years. Um, and we have taken steps to address these root causes within the major improvement strategies. Um, looking at the uh, systemic, intentional implementation alignment to Colorado academic standards, that continues to be a focus area for us. Um, the other thing is looking at PLCs. You guys have heard us talk about professional learning communities. That's something that we'll continue to have conversations about. That structure is an evidence-based structure that has shown to improve student performance. Um, and then also looking at state assessments, um, continuing to advocate and promote that to our students and to our parents that this data set really does matter. Um, the other thing that we've really spent some time on that's connected with our implementation of our core reading programs is that first year you're getting people associated with all of the different elements of these core reading programs. They're massive. There's a lot of things involved because it's not just reading, they've got other components to it. We're continuing that work um, this year, um, continuing to look at universal instruction, looking at where writing fits into these programs, but we're also looking at um, how can you leverage these programs for intensive and targeted intervention. That, that's been a key focus area for us this year. So continuing on that pathway, it's a five-year plan and we're in year two. Um, major improvement strategies in our plan, we have really clustered these into three. And these are three very, very massive improvement strategies. Um, anytime you see an action step on our plan, that represents usually 90 schools and hundreds, if not thousands of staff members. Um, and tens of thousands of students. And so it's a pretty massive thing for us to do. And so we try to do a laser-like focus of focusing in on a few things and do them and do them well. So our major improvement strategies really is to continue to talk and align ourselves with the Colorado Academic Standards. Have conversations about our student performance, look at our testing data, and make adjustments to our instructions based on what the data is telling us. The next is to continue to look at alignment of universal targeted intensive instruction. When you start to understand your standards better, you start to look at what your instruction is at a universal level to make sure that all students have access to the best tier one instruction they can have, and then adjust your systems for intensive intervention with that. The other is our continue to focus in on um, IMTSS. That's a terrible thing for me to try to say every time. I always mess that up. But it's that multi-tier system of support that's integrated across multiple domains to not only academics, but also looking at behavioral, mental health, mental health and wellness, and family and community engagement, looking at all aspects of the child. Um, we know that when students don't perform, it's not just about their effort. There are other things that are involved in looking at systems and processes we can continue to support our students. Some of the action steps, and I just touched on a few of them. Uh, we are going to continue to implement our core reading program um, at elementary. We are introducing the idea of a core uh, program at our middle schools with a pilot. That's something that's um, outlined within the plan, which is another great thing for us to be able to continue to talk about how do we align our system for universal instruction. Um, providing professional learning opportunities in those things that are evidence-based strategies. Um, continue to reinforce professional learning communities and really look at how can we improve and help people understand data and assessment. That's always a challenge. Um, not everyone is a data person like myself. Um, and I have the pleasure of being able to take the time to look at the data. How do you make that data understandable for people to be able to implement in their classroom? Um, a few other things that we've talked about is um, looking at our curriculum councils. Our curriculum councils are something that's composed of our teaching staff. Uh, we get those groups together to gather us feedback and help us 
design the supports necessary for teachers in the classroom. What better way to design supports than to hear directly from the practitioners themselves? So some of their work is to continue to review and create structures around the Colorado Academic Standards. Um, the last few years, they've been identifying priority learning outcomes for each of the different subjects, and that work will continue. But the next topic of that is now that we have those priority learning outcomes, what are the instructional resources that help us with uh, supporting those priority learning outcomes? So I'm going to take a breath here. Um, our recommendation um, as submitted within this board policy, and you all have access to the full plan, um, the full draft plan, and it's draft until such time as you all give an adoption and say it's been approved, um, is to approve that plan as written. Uh, the District Accountability Committee um, reaffirmed their recommendation to also, um, as a recommendation for you all, to draft that plan um, as drafted. So I'm going to stop there for questions. Directors, comments, questions? Director Ray. So, so Matt, or Mr. Reynolds, on back on slide 11, you, you, you talked about just how broad and huge each of these are. So I, and I don't know if it's that the state requires us to address all these areas, but you know, Superintendent Kane at our last meeting kind of drilled down to say, you know what? My goal is every, all third graders reach proficiency um, by third grade, 100%. So my question is, why do we take such a big chunk as opposed to really narrowing it down and saying, we're, gonna, we're just going to nail this one? Um, is that because the state requires us to go broad, or is, are we just overachievers? So it's actually multiple layers to it. There are some state requirements for us to address specific things within the Unified Improvement Plan, as well as some title requirements that we have within the Unified Improvement Plan that we must address. Um, when looking at this list, um, if you were to boil this down into looking at uh, quality supports, we could probably boil this down into one single statement. But I don't think that would capture all of the work that we're doing to address all of the needs of our students. So we do balance that. We balance the brevity with some of the work that we know it's going to take in order to improve performance. So that, that's a conversation that we as a group have when we look at our uh, plan. We did have four uh, major improvement strategies. So we did eliminate uh, a major improvement strategy with the idea of maintaining a laser-like focus. Um, one of the great things um, that Superintendent Kane has provided is that direction of let's focus on fewer things which causes us as a team to go and look at the Unified Improvement Plan and to ensure that when we draft that Unified Improvement Plan, even though you have multiple strategies to get to it, your lanes within those um, strategies are focused on those major areas. So take literacy. Literacy appears in all three of these. It's just approaching that literacy from a different lens. Director Meek. This is actually for our DAC members oh. that are here. So Ms. Loomer and Ms. Pointer, I just want to say thank you um, for being here tonight. And I know the DAC spends a lot of time on this work. And um, it's not only important because it helps us meet that legislative requirement, but I think it makes our district stronger. It helps, it helps not only the DAC members, but the SAC members that are there understand this process. I think it's pretty complex. And if you're not in education, I think it's kind of hard to understand. And so I just want to say thank you for being here tonight. And I don't know if you have any comments that you would want to make now that I believe you both have been through this process a couple of times. And if not, that's fine. I just want to give you an opportunity. So I would just say that Matt really does uh, uh, the lion's share of the work for to get us ready for these conversations. And the fact that he's um, so enthusiastic about data makes it very interesting for us. So truthfully, a, a shout out of appreciation to Matt and, and what he does to get this all ready. Thank you, Ms. Loomer. Other directors, comments, questions? 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. We do have to take action on this item as a board, and the recommendation for this item is that the Board of Education adopt the Unified Improvement Plan per CRS 22-11-303-1A. Do I have a motion to approve the Unified Improvement uh, Plan recommendations as presented? I move. Oh. Okay. All right, I, we'll take the motion from Meek and a second from Williams. There we go. <laughs> okay. I will call the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed 7 to 0. And again, thank you to the DAC for working with Mr. Reynolds, and thank you to Mr. Reynolds for providing such a comprehensive plan uh, here for the district. Uh, I think it's excellent and comprehensive, so thank you. All right, moving to item number 22, approval of resolution on Board of Education Committee areas of focus. Uh, Mr. Blair, if you could bring that up, please. Uh, the committee areas of focus resolution uh, attached to item number 22. There we go. So before, uh, kind of like Director Ray did with the superintendent contract modifications, I'd like to go through and if there's any suggested changes, revisions, we'll take notes on those and then we'll entertain motions and discussion before a vote. Um, just as a reminder, we discussed this in a previous meeting. Uh, my attempt was to try to collate uh, all directors' inputs, uh, especially those of liaisons that asked their committees what they wanted to work on. And this is simply modeled on, funny enough, the 2022-2023 resolution in the first part, hopefully with all uh, dates and things changed. So um, if we just move down the whereas statements, I won't read them out loud. There's only uh, four of them. If directors have any comments on or changes that they would like to see to the whereas before we move to the actual resolution. And obviously we'll go through all of the, um, the appendices here. Okay, moving to just the resolution. The uh, now therefore be resolved by the Board of Education of Douglas County School District RE1. Uh, one, that the board adopts the committee priorities set forth in the appendices and directs the board committees to focus its study on the priorities for this upcoming school year. Two, that in accordance with board governance policy, each committee may use funds, staff time, and other district resources as recently determined by the superintendent. Uh, and then all of those uh, requests will have to go through the office of uh, the superintendent for approval. The third one, that each committee's authority is set forth and subject to interpretation in accordance with board governance policy GP 1.7. And that's all for folks at home. That's all just the standing definition of our committees, what their, their primary charters are, uh, et cetera. And then number four under the resolution is that except as required by law, the committee shall not undertake study in additional areas or issues without prior board approval. That does leave our committee's flexibility if something should come up during the year or some major issue. Of course, the uh, board committees can approach the, uh, the board through their liaisons and we can make updates to this, but this is just starting. So uh, with that, any comments, questions on the resolution top sheet before we move into the appendices? Okay, Mr. Blair, if you would go down to Appendix A, we will just start with the DAC and go in order. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Director Meek and Director Myers and then Director Page who took over for Director Myers for consolidating uh, this. Uh, so this was my attempt to reflect all the input from all directors um, that hopefully reflects the DAC input on what they believe uh, they should be working on. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up for comments and questions from other directors about Appendix A. Director Ray. So number three, where it states give advice to increase parent engagement, then it, uh, we have a sub bullet. This includes following its timeline on policy KB parent and family engagement recommendations. Um, I just want to understand that because I, as I put that next to the timeline that they did propose to us, um, 
it appears to me that we haven't followed their timeline. So I'm just I'm curious what that means. Um, is this timeline the one that was recommended to us that we chose to ignore, or is this the timeline that we still have? So, for instance, what I'm looking at are things like August 18 uh, that they'll share their subcommittee progress with the board. That didn't happen. August 22nd. Board of Education meeting, present progress to the board. That didn't happen. September 1, communicate draft KB policy um, recommendations. September 21st, provide KB subcommittee updates. So I'm just confused what that, are we supporting number three and committing to actually um, allowing our DAC to do what they've been wanting to do for many months and providing us recommendations? Or are we just are these just words? I'll, I'll let Director Meek direct this uh, address the specifics. I'm using her words as the liaison, and then I'm or other directors are happy to comment. Sure. I'll do my best. Um, I participated uh, via telephone <laughs> last week, and I did my best to um, be able to hear the conversation and all. This language in here was meant to honor the timeline proposed, but understanding we are off from what was proposed. So I think the language probably needs to be updated in that regard. Um, and as I think we've heard, the subcommittee has been meeting weekly since June, and they have done work. So I think it probably needs to read or be revised that this includes following a collaboratively developed timeline on policy KB moving forward or, or something like that because right now we are off what the original proposal was. If I recall Director Meek there was a final date without all the granularity you know small steps I believe there was a final date that was a December delivery of a recommendation from a subcommittee is that correct do you have that date? that was a final but there were sub steps right there were yeah. and director a has it in front of him I, I don't have that document in front of me but there were multiple <clears throat> steps along the way um, that included engaging with SACs um, soliciting feedback having a very open and transparent process and also you know, engaging with us as an entire board and committee to have a work session, um, kind of similar to the work session we held with Long Range Planning Committee last year around some of those boundary and issue and capacity, you know, challenges. We had a whole board work session with LRPC. So that was the request from DAC that has um, moved forward. There were resolutions made in the past. There were promises made in the past you know, that, that you know, the, there, there would be a timeline, they would have an opportunity to move forward. The board voted on a resolution that we would give them that opportunity to engage. So, so this was my attempt to make sure that we're including a collaborative process, but I do think the exact timeline needs to be revised from the original proposed timeline, but I would suggest keeping that December final date as a, as a good final date. And I'm looking out to see if that feels appropriate, and I see nods. Yeah, I, I, as one director, I wouldn't want to go in and say, and on this date you have to do this, and on this date you have to do that. If the intent of the DAC is to provide a recommendation to the board in December, um, I would probably just recommend changing uh, 3A to this includes providing input on policy KB parent and family engagement recommendations no later than the end of December 2023. That gives the DAC flexibility. It doesn't dictate the how to them. It just says you get to a recommendation to the board by basically the end of this calendar year, knowing that we have uh, significant holiday break and things like that. And then, of course, the board, just like any recommendation, would look at that recommendation, decide whatever the next steps would be to take up, reject, get more data, you know, whatever would happen. And if that's agreeable, rather than say the timeline because of the, the comments that were made both by yourself and Director Ray. Yeah, I, I think given that we're off the timeline, moving towards that other language makes a lot more sense. 
Yeah, and, and it's supposed to be general priorities, not, you know, we don't want to get in the granular. Um, one of the things uh, on here is number five, which is policy ADD, and that's something that I, as one director, specifically asked for at the retreat. We've got a slight, well, not slightly, we have a significantly different ask on the ballot this November relative to the MLO. We have the same ask for salary benefits, teachers and staff, and then frankly, barring best practices from 27J and other areas and in the wake of the Uvalde shooting last year, et cetera, um, we added a specific security component um, not just the DAC, but I would also take it to the Safety and Security Committee. And as Director Ray knows, we've already made that soft ask through Deputy Hyatt that our Safety and Security Committee provide input on any changes should this pass. Would also like to get DAC recommendations on does it need to just stay the same? Do there need to be different standards? Um, does our our policy ADD around safe schools need to change, especially in terms of funding or plans that would be implemented should the MLO pass. I would also, just like the LRPC uh, as a board when we vote on this, indicate that we would also like a plan of should it not pass, <laughs> right? Because we have to plan for both contingencies. So if an update needs to occur, based on additional funding or the lack thereof. I think that's something that I, at least as one director, would be interested in. Other director comments on that? Director Myers, then Meek, and then Ray. Director Myers. So as the previous liaison to DAC, I do want to say that I believe as one board member, I was the one that really suggested the subcommittee and the timeline. Uh, Subcommittee, thank you. Uh, timeline, probably. I'm sorry we're off on that. I, I will honor the December. I know that at the one meeting we did talk about fitting in a work session and the difficulty with I, it just lots of stuff was on our plate this fall and the election and the, just turnaround of things that could happen, but I'm still in. Um, I do want to let you know that I'm still in favor of having that conversation and working with the DAC. Uh, Director Meek, then Director Ray. Yes, so my question with the give advice on policy ADD, it's very generic and just trying to understand at what level we're asking for their input because I, I, I just want to have clear expectations. So we don't go sideways because there's a lack of clarity. And so do we see asking for advice on the policy as one meeting where they're focused on the policy or do we see it as a series of meetings? You know, so I guess I'm just trying to think, what is the scope of their input that we're seeking on this policy? Director Ray, and then I'll we'll try to address it. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. That was kind of one of my um, requests to when we when we did policy ADD before in 2018, I believe, our safety and security committee went through that policy line by line by line, and really, to me, that made sense that that group really did the most work in discussing what strategies made sense in a comprehensive school safety plan. And then it would go to DAC to provide feedback. Um, because I think, as you know, Director Peterson, there are some conversations at that level that can't necessarily be done in a public manner. Um, and so I think uh, that's where I would start with the Safety and Security Committee to really dig deeply into the look reviewing ADD then coming to your DAC and saying, here's the recommendations of revisions that our safety and security committee is making, and then giving them an opportunity to react to those. Because uh, I agree with Director Meek, I think the scope for a DAC to do that kind of work, to me, wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. So. Yeah, would it read better if we wrote, give advice on any proposed policy ADD changes? And I would, I would imagine we would lean, as you said, rightfully so, very heavily on our safety and security committee to offer proposed changes 
it would then be brought before the board in terms of a draft with a potential, uh, certainly not a, a first reading, but at least a second, possibly a third reading. And at that time, we would charter DAC and other committees as appropriate to comment on the proposed revisions. But I would imagine the most of those revisions or recommendations to the board would come directly from safety and security as re and district leadership. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with the, that revision to give feedback on any changes to policy ADD. Right. I don't know that we want advice in there because your safety and security committee are your experts. Yeah. They're the ones that should be giving us advice, but I, I think uh, giving us feedback on the change, on any proposed changes on policy ADD makes sense yeah. to me. So just, just to keep us up to speed, um, I've revised 3A to, this includes providing input on policy KB parent and family engagement recommendations no later than the end of December 2023. And then sub bullet five for the DAC would be provide feedback on any policy or any proposed policy ADD uh, safe school changes. Any uh, other directors, Director Williams, then Director Myers? Yeah, so just following up on 3A on the KB policy. Um, first, I just want to make sure that everyone also understands that this does not negate that the, the board did pass the, the policy in June. And so that the, the DAC would be looking at the current policy, um, making recommendations there. And that also the superintendent is um, doing an R policy uh, that would follow the implementation. And so just, I don't know if we want to add something in there about the implementation policy, but certainly um, having the DAC reflect on that as well. But just so that everybody knows that the policy that was passed in June is in place and that if, if the DAC would look at the current policy, that would be helpful for us. Director Myers. Okay, same comment. Other directors, Director Meek. Yeah, thank you. I think that's great to clarify that. It is actually a policy that's in effect right now. Um, the bullets on the bottom are mostly items that the DAC has always um, been required to be part of or have contributed to. And I did see that uh, Director Page added the strategies to limit bullying and the limiting negative effects of social media and personal technology use in schools. So I really wanted to just have an opportunity to have us discuss that because as a liaison, I just want to make sure we have clarity because we need to help provide that to that committee. Yeah, the, my one comment about all the bullets, we've got the five kind of primary and then it's kind of uh, other topics. It's kind of the catch-all. My only concern for the DAC is five plus, uh, let's see, what is that, eight? We, we've given them 13 things to work on this year. Um, back to the previous discussion with Mr. Reynolds in, in, in kind of staying narrow but go deep. Um, you know, I wouldn't want the DAC to take this as you have to give us something or you have to touch on all these. These are the priorities. I would say definitely stick with one through five, and these others would be as opportunity or as time allows, because uh, I don't think our DAC wants to meet, uh, what, weekly now for the rest of the year? Because that's what it would look like. Yeah, we're getting thumbs down. Um, one other thing I would like to highlight is the language uh, on the cart was taken from to mirror the LRPC language so there's no confusion. Um, I think there was some confusion potentially uh, around CART and DAC just provides a representative just like LRPC provides a representative but the CART itself with represent, represent, representation from our committees is what actually is providing the recommendation. It's not the individual committees providing recommendations on um, the charter applications and things. So I just thought that was clarifying and that it was better to have consistent language for all our committees that are involved in CART. So uh, that was another change. D Director Meek. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're highlighting that because that has been a big topic of conversation in that committee. And there was a long email that was sent with concerns and questions around, you know, these, um, the legislative requirements and what DAC's role is in that process. And I think we left it with Superintendent Kane was going to be responding to that, right? I'm not sure if you've had a chance to do that yet. 
That is correct. I cannot recall which meeting I am scheduled to attend um, along with the uh, charter team, but we'll make sure that we've got um, clarity as we gear up for another CART process. Any other directors' comments, questions uh, about the list here? I, I have no um, issue with any of the list. I think it's all in the domain of the DAC. Again, my is one director. My concern is that's a pretty long list. Yeah, so I'm not sure how the last two bullets, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, was it Director Page that added the last two bullets? I just want to have clarity in case there's questions around what the expectations are. I really want to make sure we understand the scope of what we're asking and expecting of committees. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to the last one. I actually added that based on board discussion at the last meeting as being uh, what seemed to be a priority for the board. I know it's something that the district leadership's looking at, and it seemed like something specifically the, the DAC and the SACs may want to weigh in on because uh, just like we have middle schoolers that want to opt out of testing, I imagine there's going to be a strong, a very strong student voice and parental voice around any policies that might be constructed around devices and social media. Uh, Director Page, did you want to reply? Yeah, I think you just, I brought that up in the DAC meeting as, again, the discussions we had with presentations we had at the last meeting of um, even to try to even figure out where where these types of issues would lie. Would, would they lie in a safe schools policy? Would they lie in a, you know, an electronics use policy that we, I don't, I've, dug into all our policies. I don't think we have a specific personal electronic use policy. We have like a district, you know, technology use policy. So just kind of wanting to have that out there just so that, um, you know, as they're working on things, if they see an avenue to where you could possibly, you know, add that as something for a safe schools policy or another policy that they're digging into. Um, so get, getting specific on what to do with that, um, I think it's kind of, it, Again, it's something that now is being talked of as an area of focus, so maybe just to even figure out where that where it lands. Yeah. Yeah, just to, I, I believe all the other bullets that are listed here relate to other DAC topics as identified by CRS. Like, the state legislature asks a lot of our DAC committee members, um, specifically strategies to limit bullying. Like, I love, you know, the, the bullet. I'm just not sure if it really fits here or if it fits above or what we're tasking them to do. And so, again, I, I just, clear, you know, Clear communication, clear expectations is really helpful. So I think if we want to include um, strategies to limit bullying or the social media, personal technology use in schools, it probably doesn't fit under the bullets at the bottom because yeah. I think those really are specific to CRS. Yeah, and I, and I would say one other thing is kind of like we talked about with policy ADD where it's feedback on proposed changes. We probably want to make the, bullet, the last two bullets, if we were to keep them in some form, be feedback on staff slash Board of Education um, proposals limiting, right, rather than have DAC just kind of go off on their own direction where staff is working down one path. Uh, I think we would want to sequence them in after there was a baseline proposal from either the staff and or the board, just just so we honor their time. So maybe even striking them for this year because I honestly think we're gonna see development by first the, the staff, then a proposal to the board, then it would be in time to engage. And that, that may limit, uh, again, not that these are not important, they're very important topics. It's just to unload the DAC and kind of sequence them, them in at the right time. Director Ray. I was going to say I concur to, to strike because they really could come up in safety and security. They could come up in policy sure. review. So, I mean, I just think um, just, yeah, I think striking the specific language so there's no uh, misunderstanding. Okay. And I, th I think we're getting all shaking heads here. So just to be clear on this, uh, 3A as amended, uh, 5 as amended with feedback around the proposed changes, and then just striking the last two around bullying and stuff because 
um, there's going to be other work. Um, all right, moving on to B, Mr. Blair, if we can go to B, the FOC. By the way, I think the DAC and the SAC are probably the, the hardest ones. The others are pretty cut and dried. Um, so, uh, Director Weininger, I think we got these accurate from what the committee looked at. So, audit, uh, quarterly financial and budget input. Uh, we changed this instead of looking at to posting, we made it an action verb this year to actually post a citizen's budget guide is the third one. So that's a nuance change from last year. And then we have the four areas of inquiry there. Again, um, the, the kind of if things pass, if things don't pass, uh, looking at departmental reviews, financial impact of growth and decline, which remains uh, probably in my mind the most significant challenge facing the district at the strategic level after the funding uh, stuff on the ballot. And then this was a new one requested this year, I believe by the FOC, uh, an SBB overview, uh, specifically the formula or, or whoever, maybe Director Ray or, or whoever it came from. But I, I think that's certainly appropriate. Any discussion, uh, rewording questions, comments on Appendix B for the FOC? Director Weiniger. I forgot to um, remove security on the department reviews because we actually reviewed them last year. Um, that's just a small thing. Cause okay, so strike security because yeah. it was just completed on number two under the areas of inquiry. <laughs> Got it. Any others? Okay, Mr. Blair, if we can move to Appendix C, the loquacious LRPC uh, areas, a little bit longer. Um, but we have main areas, and again, these are these ones pretty much carry year to year, so no significant changes because the LRPC just does what the LRPC does, and it's incredibly value. So the first one's around SCUBA, the uh, School Capacity and Boundary Analysis. Again, very critical, and will absolutely be impacted by bond mill passage or not. The master capital plan, the uh, the best two inches you'll ever read here in the district. Um, the property, facility, and land inventory, again, that will have huge repercussions depending on bond mill passage or not. And then finally, the cart language, uh, which reflects the same type of language that we saw with the DAC. Any questions, comments, uh, wording changes on LRPC? Director Ray. Superintendent Kane uses a different term for the decline. What is it? Decline? Growth and decline. And I'm just wondering, can we capture that in this? Um, just so we have some parallel language. Um, I mean, it, I, mean I, I think the bullets get at what that plan is going to define. But I just would like to see some parallel language, some connection to what Superintendent Kane and her staff are doing around developing a five-year plan for decrease and growth. Yeah, it, if I may offer a place to put that in, and I agree for consistent language, uh, under one, uh, the LRPC will review and provide recommendations to the Board of Education regarding school attendance boundaries, facility usage, mobile classrooms, and other capacity and boundary-related uh, suggestions in response to district growth and decline challenges. Would that be a good catch-all? Yeah. Okay, other directors, questions, comments? Comment. Director Williams. I, just a quick comment. There was uh, some emails kind of bouncing around uh, LRPC, just talking about uh, if the bond were not to pass, um, it would become obvious that we'll likely need to use more operating budget. And so, I'm not sure that falls under LRPC. It's probably more FOC, but um, just want to throw that out there for the public to kind of just understand that that that's a consequence if if the bond does not pass. So, yeah. Other directors, comments, questions? Okay, if we can move to. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry, Superintendent Kane. Just something minor, President Peterson, the um, CART, it's actually Charter Application Review Team. Um, we will ensure that that is correctly denoted throughout the entire document. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, if we can move to Appendix D, Mr. Blair. It's getting shorter. The uh, MBOC, charge the MBOC uh, is up there, familiar with the 2018 mill levy and bond program and project list, monitor the progress, so they will continue to do that. I believe we're still on track to complete all the expenditures by February, as uh, cautioned during our last presentation from the MBOC. Uh, a new addition there is the uh, the decision tree that if the 2023 mill levy override and or bond initiatives are approved by voters, the charge above shall extend to those measures. So they will just pick up the additional bond and or mill. And then uh, the third standing one there was considering modifying the bylaws to expand and simplify MBOC membership. Is that still a desired third area of focus? Director I Monitor. believe so. We started on it. Um, so I, I think they would like to keep working on it if need be. Okay, any other questions, comments on MBOC? Okay. Just one question. Yeah, Director, Director Ray. I, and I don't know how you would change the wording, but I think one of the things that I was concerned about with the report from MBOC is that there was so much focus on the bond side that there wasn't a lot of oversight on the MLO side. And I don't know how to communicate that. I don't know if that needs to be communicated here, but I'd sure like us to see us be celebrating what the MLO is providing in equal <laughs> equal uh, amounts of time to the to the bond. So. Yeah, I, I I don't know that that needs to be in the priorities, but probably something our liaison could take back to the uh, to the FOC for a little more emphasis and, and balance. Thank you. Okay, moving into uh, Appendix E, the SAG. We have uh, the student improvement topics, and as uh, Jake was actually briefing earlier, I was checking off number two to make sure we got them all, and I, I believe we actually did get the correct list in uh, the subcommittee focus areas. So we have the uh, student improvement topics. One of the big changes here, and I tried to merge your language directory with other language, uh, the key change in number three is the SAG will explore mechanisms for increasing student outreach and input from all grade levels. That That's the big change in, in the charge there for SAC is try to reach down below the high school and, and middle school, engage students and try to, um, I, I know it may be difficult, but try to reach down across the full um, spectrum of grades that we have there, you know, different things there. Uh, then finally, uh, policy review, uh, review proposed policy updates and implementation that directly affects student behavior. So that that's another standing one there. Any questions, comments on wording and language for Appendix E? All right, so just to quickly recap, going backwards, E, no changes, D, no changes from what is presented there. C is adding the clause about in response to district growth and decline challenges. There is a note from the superintendent uh, getting the right CART acronym universally throughout the document. Um, B, just pulling off the security in sub bullet two under areas of inquiry. Um, and then all the changes discussed in a revising 3A to a end of December uh, input, revising five to feedback on any proposed uh, policy changes and then striking the bottom two. There were no uh, changes recommended to the resolution cover page itself. Um, with that, I'll entertain uh, any motions to approve the resolution as modified as I just discussed and then we can have discussion before votes if we have a motion. Is there a motion to approve the resolution of the Board of Education regarding 23-24 priorities of the board committee amended as just stated? Move to approve the 23-24 priorities for board committees and appendices as revised and stated. We have a motion by Ray. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Uh, Director Myers, quick on the draw, gets the second. Um, discussions, <laughs> comments on the motion before we go to a vote. Okay, with that, I will call the roll. Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Page? Aye. Um, before I vote, my one, uh, as one director, my one guidance to the DAC is um, please provide us comments on the current policy. We got some previous ones on a previous policy. And um, again, only as one director, um, if there is a recommendation to remove, again, based on some comments tonight, 
the fundamental right of parents to raise their children as they see fit, or there's something in there around removing the prohibition on compelled speech. Just as one director, it's something I'm not interested in. Maybe a recommendation of the committee, if it is, bring it forward and we'll consider it. But I've gotten a lot of strong combat as uh, feedback and comments as one director on that. But that being said, uh, looking forward to your input, and uh, I am a I, Director Ray. So I was just I was just uh, processing what you just said, Director <laughs> Peterson. But I, I would just say I would caution us not to predetermine what nope. the DAC's work is, and that would have been cured if we had granted a collaborative work session with them to begin with. So I would just say that I think we're our own worst enemy in ignoring their motions and their request to work with us from the get-go. That said, I'm an aye. Director, uh, Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. Passed seven to zero. Now moving in. Uh, now moving into our pre-planned break, which we will now take for uh, just short of 15 minutes. We will reconvene at 8.25.
To order, we are now on item number 23, Board of Education Community Engagement Plan update, a 10 minute discussion, uh, Director Williams and Director Meek. All right, <laughs> so if we can, actually, I'm just gonna jump way far ahead and go to page, the bottom of page three into page four, please, Mr. Blair. Um, if you'll keep scrolling where it says some other questions we may want to consider. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I, th I think when Director Meek and I were talking, and I know we talked as a board, that the, the people that we would be targeting this year would be charters, uh, uh, seniors or people in the district that don't have kids, and then also uh, young parents without kids yet in the district. And I think our first focus is going to be the charter leaders, and we're hoping to do that sometime in November. So first, I wanted to talk about the, the date that we could potentially propose and what might work for, for the board. Do we either want to tack it on before the board meeting on the 13th? Is that the day, or is it the 14th? Uh, it's the 14th um, of November. And, and do it before the board meeting. Or would everyone want to do it on a, a separate evening? What, what, how do we think we're going to get the most participation? And then also, I proposed some questions for charters because I felt like, what are we going to do to actually get participation? How are we going to be relevant to each group that we speak to? And I recognize it's supposed to be a three-year rolling um, engagement plan, but when speaking to, to charter leaders, I think talking about our mission and vision may not be the best use of time considering they have their own mission and visions in addition to the fact that what, what could we get them, what questions could we ask them that would want them to participate? So anyway, those are just some questions that I proposed. It's not obviously set in stone. And then uh, what everybody's thoughts were either adding it to before the meeting that would obviously need to be done at Wilcox or doing it potentially the following evening on the Wednesday um, and, and having it maybe somewhere else that's more central. So, Director Meek, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just concur that it, it makes sense to have slightly tweaked questions for those governing boards. Um, the charter governing boards, we had, if I remember correctly, last year, we weren't sure if, if it made sense to hold it as part of you know, a pre-session or if it needed to be separate. So I defer to you know, the other board members that have more experience working within the charter governing leadership. Um, I think both Director Williams and Paige were both on governing boards, right? Oh, you weren't? OK. What do you think the preference would be? I think um, asking you guys to answer the question. Um, obviously, dealing just with the, um, um, just the timing. I mean, obviously, we you know we start here at five, so like if it's before, you know, it could be just a time crunch. Um, but I think um, I think for leadership, I think that I think um, double dipping on a on a uh, a board evening. Um, wouldn't be out of the question. I think we could. I think they'd be amenable to doing something like that. A pre meet, like a pre. Yeah, certainly. From we we can always do a pre meeting study work session prior to a board meeting. Um, my only wondering, and uh, others would know better than me, is we. I don't know if that's a better thing for our charter leaders to you know and charter folks to come show up, um, or whether just doing it on a, a separate evening. Um, would be more beneficial. I, whatever maximizes participation, I think, is the goal. I mean, we can always propose, put out a poll and say, do you prefer A or B, and just go with the majority. Director Meek. Yeah, so my, my gut tells me, first off, if I don't think this setup would be the right setup, right? And so I just do wonder if maybe Legacy Campus offers an opportunity to showcase some of the options that are available to students at that campus 
and that might be a draw as well. Yeah, yeah agreed. And, and always these evenings uh, could go super long, you know, when you, you tack in. Uh, I mean, the amount of time for engagement, what are we anticipating? Two hours, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Superintendent Kane. Um, I think a Wednesday night is a good idea. I think a lot of our charters have their own board meetings on Tuesdays or Thursdays, but not as many on Wednesdays. And I just did want to let you all know that I'm out of town on November 15th. So if I'm um, required, I don't, I don't know if that's a consideration. I am in town the 29th. So for what it's worth. Thank you. Yeah, I would think that the superintendent was definitely a value add during last year's because there were a lot of issues that were policy related, but there were also quite a few inputs that were operationally related that were good that the superintendent could hear them first. Yeah, I think I think it's essential to have you there. Yeah, absolutely. Director Williams. So I guess I would just throw it out to the rest of the board members. Are there any additional questions that you think would be good to ask charters or how do you feel about the questions that um, are in the policy or in the engagement plan as is? Any board directors? <laughs> Director Ray. I don't have any uh, additional questions for charters. I was thinking about uh, senior citizens, of which I am one, I think. <laughs> um, but I think it would be really helpful. That's a group that's really hard for us to tap as a district sometimes in terms of just being able to relay and gather information. So I would think a question would be, what, would be, what is a good vehicle for us to reach you? You know, is it, is, is it we show up on your site at your senior living center? Is it, you know, just really getting clear about how, what would be a good communication vehicle uh, for that group? Because I think we always struggle with those <laughs> voters in particular. Other directors? Okay, Director Meeker, Director Williams, do you need any other additional information other than we'll, it, it sounds like the date we're looking at is now w which, 29th. Okay, and I think we'll, would we, uh, Superintendent, would we work that outreach through Ms. Roush or what would be the best way to get that on an official schedule? I, thank you for the question. Yes, we can work that outreach. Okay, we'll get that on the official board schedule. We'll get the invitations out early and hopefully we'll have a, a pretty good turnout. Any other items that either of you need for outreach for next steps? Okay, thank you. We'll move to item number 24, discussion of settlement related to pending litigation, specifically Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education et al. Pending in District Court, Douglas County, case number 2022CV30071. And thank you, Mr. Blair. Um, just to lay the groundwork on this, uh, this is a resolution that Mr. Blue drafted. He has arrived and is uh, present in the audience. If there are any questions or if we need to motion to go into executive session for any advice. Um, but this is a resolution that he drafted um, without getting ahead of ourselves. Um, and please, board directors, correct me if there's any misstatements. Um, we go through here the whereas Robert Marshall filed a lawsuit. Uh, Titled there, there was a court trial on the 12th. Uh, on the 16th, the district court issued its finding and fact and, con and conclusions. There were three charges. Uh, one, a violation of Colorado meeting laws, which the uh, board was found guilty of a violation of Colorado open meeting laws. So that was judged for the plaintiff. There were two other requests. One was to enter a permanent injunction and the other was to vacate the termination of the previous superintendent. Uh, the plaintiff did not prevail on those other two changes. Um, moving on to the one, two, three, fourth whereas statement, um, the plaintiff, Mr. Marshall, indicated that he would possibly appeal part of it. The specific part he was looking to appeal was the injunction part. Um, plaintiff was in, is entitled per the CRS there based on the fact that it is a Colorado open meeting laws lawsuit. There's specific law around award of fees and who can get those and who can't. 
the plaintiff has claimed the total amount of damages, uh, or not damages, excuse me, that's a different court case, uh, to incur uh, fees and costs as listed in the WARA statement, 99-330-50, and then 3,677-34 in costs. Mr. Blair, if you can scroll down. Um, the board uh, believes the plaintiff may not be entitled to the full amount of fees and costs he claims, but wants to resolve the matter. The plaintiff has offered, agree, uh, has offered through his attorney to the board's attorney to not file an appeal in the case if the defendants will agree to pay the full amount of the submitted fees and costs listed above. And then the resolution, basically, um, if we approve this resolution, the board would authorize the district to play the, pay, the, pay the plaintiff his full fees in exchange for the plaintiff agreeing not to appeal uh, the case. And my understanding is that appeal would be relative to the injunction portion uh, only. So with that explanation, um, comments, question by board members, uh, or things they would like to see changed on the resolution, knowing that it's really the resolve part that we would have to enter into an agreement with between um, us and the plaintiff. Director Ray. Um, so I'll just lead up by saying I have a lot of um, concerns with what's missing in the whereas statements. And even Director Peterson, as you were capturing those, you were verbalizing a lot of words that weren't in the actual resolution. And if, you know, it's just, um, to me, there's a lot of stuff missing from the whereas. And I'll just kind of throw out a few. I mean, this started back in February 2022, which the way this resolution reads, it almost looks like it started on June 16th, 2023, or June 12th. Um, but I, I would recommend, first of all, telling the story accurately of this 19-month issue that we've struggled with. Um, so I would advocate for a whereas statement that says a motion for a preliminary injunction prohibiting further violations of the Colorado Open Means Law was filed and a court hearing was conducted on February 5th, 2022. I would advocate that um, on March 9th, 2022, the court ruled that the criteria for a preliminary injunction had been met and Director Myers, Peterson, Williams, and Weiniger which I would hereafter refer to as the defendants as opposed to the board, um, were enjoined from engaging in discussions on public business or taking formal action by three or more members of the board except in public meetings open to the public. Um, I think it's significant for us to state that the Colorado School District self-insurance pool, SIDSIP, declined covering the cost of this lawsuit because the allegations were considered intentional as opposed to negligent conduct. I think it's important to say that, that the court denied the defendants a motion to dismiss the lawsuit on April 29, 2023. I think it's important to say that uh, proposed settlements by the plaintiff um, were declined and mediation was not successful. Um, and uh, we had several opportunities for settlement and I, you know, I, I just charted the, the dates, for, you know, April or, yeah, April 29th, 2022, December 16th, 2022, and most recently, uh, May 8th, 2023. And the reason I think all these details are important is when our constituents read this amount of $103,000, it needs to be demonstrated that this was the reflection of 19 months of litigation. Um, I, will, I can go on. Um, there's a whereas statement, uh, where is that, that I feel like we need to insert that on June 16th, the court declared that defendant's conduct was in violation. We haven't even stated that in this resolution that, that the, the defendants, the four of you, were convicted of a violation of Colorado Open Meetings Law. 
but they declined making the temporary injunction permanent, stating that the court's belief that the defendants would follow the law going forward. Uh, I think there needs to be a uh, whereas statement that the plaintiff filed a motion for partial reconsideration regarding the court's ruling to decline issuing a permanent injunction, and it was denied by the court. And I think that we also need to recognize that the reason that the fees are being considered is because the plaintiff prevailed, um, and he's entitled to his reimbursement of attorney fees and cost. So I feel like that, and I'm just, you know, I think the tip of the iceberg, but it just seems like this lacks the story. I mean, <laughs> we can't ignore the fact that the first time in Douglas County School District history, board members were convicted of violating law. And again, just as I talked about with the superintendent's contract, we need to document in such a way that protects the system from this happening again. And I think part of that is telling the story, telling the truth, as hard as it may be to hear, but we need to tell the truth of what happened. And I think we need to talk about what has been learned. You know, we, we have dealt with this for 19 months and I have yet to see us on the dais talk about what has been learned. Um, you know, there were initially responses like, I did nothing wrong, or the judge made a mistake in how he interpreted color open meetings law, or my, my personal favorite is, well, if he would not sue us, then there was, wouldn't be an issue. Um, so I, I, I just think we need to talk about, so what did we learn? Because it's a pretty significant investment when you look at the plaintiff's cost plus our attorney's cost, we're looking at a quarter of a million dollars, over a quarter of a million dollars for these, uh, this violation. And I think our public, we owe our public some kind of way to say, you know, yes, we learned a lesson and this is the lesson that we've learned. So I know I'm throwing a lot out there at once, but I guess I'll, I'll back up a little bit and just say, I first of all think we need to have a resolution that clearly documents not only for us, but for future boards to come, the story that occurred and the facts. Because that's what a resolution does. It leads up to the therefore statement of why are we therefore asking or settling with this amount of money. So I just feel like the, the whereas statements lack in detail. Other directors? Director Weiniger. Um, I feel like a, a, quite a few of those whereases, um, I would disagree on how you portrayed them. And I think um, simplifying this is actually more ideal and how we're going to agree as a board on this resolution to finally get this behind us. And um, so I feel like if we're going to add all these whereases, we could spend all night on it. Um, but I'd rather just get this going and... Um, get it passed rather than feeling like we have to tell the whole story. Um, I think this simplifies it enough for me. If it would please Director Ray, I don't mind adding to the third whereas on June 16th, the district court issued its findings of fact and conclusions, including that the, wherever we say defendants or list them, I don't care, were found guilty of violations of Colorado open meeting law. Again, we could go, I agree with Director Weiniger, we could also go into the fact that uh, Mr. Marshall refused very uh, various settlements. I want to be careful here not to discuss contents of me uh, mediation or executive session, but he also refused various settlements. And we heard various speakers here at night say, well, we could have settled this, and then there was extra, extra cost. Those extra, extra costs were, uh, we were ready to uh, resolve fees and Mr. Marshall filed multiple um, re, uh, requests for reconsideration. He filed a, if I remember correctly, a re re request for reconsideration and then two subsequent requests for a request for the reconsideration, dragging this out, uh, frankly, for months and incurring costs on both sides. And saying that he prevailed, he prevailed on, certainly on the one count, the one I just cited, 
But he continued to press again and again and again for this permanent injunction, which I believe um, that's what we're addressing here today. Uh, he has indicated that he, if we do not settle for paying his fees, exactly what this resolution says, that he may still consider and may appeal this ruling just for the injunction, not, certainly not for the Colorado Open Meeting Law. He wouldn't appeal that portion of it. And so what we're really here to decide as a board is, one, are we ready to put this behind us and move forward as many directors have gotten up here and, and, and stated? And I'm happy to, to state some learnings, as I have before, and I will only speak for myself as one director. I certainly uh, would not have gone about uh, the termination of the superintendent in the way that I did. Um, that is a huge lesson learned for me. Um, I think some of the earlier discussions we had around superintendent um, uh, reporting and contract uh, might act as future safeguards. So I'm glad to see that we're putting some learning in that. Um, that being said, had we gone through a different process with an evaluation and stuff, I would certainly at this point, even more so at this point, uh, especially given what has happened after uh, this lawsuit was filed and uh, a threatened litigation by the former superintendent, I would absolutely cast my vote uh, again uh, from the dais to replace the superintendent. That being said, this is what we need to do uh, if we approve this, this is what we need to do to go forward and frankly at this point, back to lessons learned, avoid future costs in this specific matter because Mr. Marshall, if we do not approve this resolution tonight, uh, has indicated a, a desire or a potential that he will actually appeal this case, dragging this out for I don't know how much longer and then we're into appeals court. And then the last thing I'll say, and this is for the public, this is for all the town councils, committees, and uh, we've had a lot of folks uh, out here in Colorado come in and support 5A and 5B and pass resolutions. If the particular aspect of the case that Mr. Marshall is looking to appeal that does go to appeal and we were to lose on appeal, it would become precedent setting here in Colorado because once you have an appellate decision, it becomes precedence and that injunction would not just affect the Douglas County School Board and four current members who are not going to serve, you know, in perpetuity here, that's for sure. Um, it would affect every town council, every committee, every potential uh, assembly group, whether profit, not for profit, and potentially put radical changes into the interpretation of Colorado open meeting laws that don't exist today. And it would have a negative effect that would ripple across the entire state of Colorado. And that, among many things, not just the fiscal stewardship, is one reason I would say we should take this settlement, uh, we should approve it as a board, we should pay the costs that are due under the uh, CRS as cited up there and not risk putting all of our, our other uh, boards, councils, committees across the state of Colorado in jeopardy. Uh, last comment on that, Mr. Marshall is in a very unique position. He's not only the plaintiff, he's a legislature, legislator. And if he believes there should be a different interpretation of Colorado open meeting laws, rather trying to force that change through the courts, through an appeal process, he should just bring up a bill in the next session and have his uh, compatriots up there under the Golden Dome pass a different interpretation. So, uh, Director Williams. I, I would be happy to add in the first whereas uh, the February date just so that we can have the 19 months recognized there that way. Um, we can show when it started and obviously if it's signed today, everyone would know when it ended. Um, I also just, Director Ray just wanted to make a distinction. You said that we were convicted. Um, being convicted is a criminal term. So I would say we were found to have violated the law in which I can totally accept. Um, I will also say that speaking to what public commenters came up and said that in May we had a public discussion and we've cost the district 37,000 more dollars. I could easily flip that the other way and simply say that the plaintiff has cost the district an extra $37,000. I, as one board member, was willing to, at that time, agree to an injunction um, at, at which he would have gotten what he wanted there, but he was so insistent upon the admission of guilt that he pushed forward and then lost on the injunction aspect. So 
I would say that, in fact, the plaintiff is the one that costs this district more money, and we could have settled far sooner than this. Um, even what Director Ray has said, you know, there were other settlement discussions being had throughout, and um, as one board member, I can say I was willing to make some um, concessions. So that's it. Other directors? Director Meek. So I agree we need to put this behind us. I think, um, I think you have three board members 19 months ago and that was the mantra. We've got to put this behind us. We need to settle this the whole time and it's now 19 months later and the ballot will drop in less than a month and I have brought this up over and over that when I am talking to community groups, this is what they want to talk about. And they have trust issues. And so I think it's imperative that we settle this this evening. I agree with Director Ray that we definitely need to put something of substance in here. I don't know if you remember in June after the judge ruled, I read a two page resolution. Um, I read it into the record where I pulled direct quotes from the judge. So maybe I'll just offer one or two of those. Um, whereas on June 16th, 2023, the court granted declaratory judgment regarding four board directors past violations of the Colorado Open Meeting Law. And whereas a substantial violation has occurred in regard to governance process 1.1, the board will govern lawfully as determined by the findings of fact, conclusions of law and orders under case number, and I cite it. Um, but the quotes from the ruling is the court finds that the plaintiff has proved that the individual defendant's conduct was in violation of the Colorado Open Meeting Law, that by their conduct, the plaintiff was deprived of rights under Colorado Open Meeting Law, and he is entitled to a declaratory judgment to that effect, pursuant to the citation. Um, the court finds that the decision made at a February 4th, 2022 meeting was a rubber stamping of the discharge discussion and decision that constituted the Colorado open meeting law violation by the individual defendants and the violation therefore went uncured. So that was direct language from the ruling that I think helps to explain it. Now granted my prior resolution was a lot longer. <laughs> it has other statements in there as well, but I do think we need to document it. I also think it is extremely important in the therefore statement that the board takes accountability to the public in steps it will do moving forward. And what I had proposed prior was now therefore be it resolved that the DCSD Board of Ed will take the following steps to address these violations and safeguard the best interests of our district. One, engage in comprehensive training on board governance, including the Colorado Open Meeting Law, fiduciary duties, and the principle of board holism. Two, conduct a thorough review of our policies and procedures to strengthen safeguards against future violations. And three, implement regular evaluations and audits to ensure compliance with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. I felt it was really important that we acknowledge what has happened and say, here are some steps that we will take moving forward to help rebuild trust. As I said, you know, thinking about the quarter of a million dollars that has gone into this, when you look at all fees, when you count what we've paid our attorneys, what we're paying through this resolution, it's, it's over a quarter million dollars and that makes me ill. But what really is challenging is the loss of trust that will haunt us for a period of time and I don't know how long it will take to restore that trust, but I do think putting some steps that we're willing to put in place moving forward 
might help address that moving forward. Other directors? Director Ray. Yeah, I, um, just a couple of other things on this resolution that I think are unnecessary. Uh, plaintiff is unhappy with the court's decision. Well, the defendants were unhappy as well. So I don't, I don't see why we need to necessarily um, mention that the plaintiff was unhappy and wants to appeal part of it. Um, I think that's not, in, not critical information as all the other whereas that I think I've talked about, Director Meek has talked about. The other one is uh, the board believes a plaintiff is not entitled to the full amount of fees and costs he, he claims but wants to resolve this matter now without an appeal. Um, I don't think that's necessarily reflective of my thinking. I mean, I think when we drag something out for 19 months and legal counsel on both sides are having to do service for us, they absolutely are entitled to their, their fees that they said they would be charging up front. So, I, so I, that, one, that one bothers me as well. Um, I'm trying to think about how to move us forward because I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, I appreciate, Director Peterson, especially your statement that you would have done things differently with the termination of the superintendent. Because I, I think that's, what I, that's, the, that's the new learning that I think I really wanted to hear all of us talk about. Because when I hear us talk about blaming the plaintiff, to me it's almost like telling the police officer that pulls me over for speeding that, gee, I think you misinterpreted the speed sign and if you didn't pull me over, this wouldn't be an issue. I mean, I, I don't think that we should spend time blaming the plaintiff for suing, especially when the court has ruled, and I will accept uh, Dr. Hector Williams' correction, that the court has ruled that you violated the law. Um, so that's the, that was the stuff I didn't want to hear tonight. I really wanted to hear that we get it. We get that we need to do public business on the dais. We can't play phone tag and then come to the dais and make decisions. Um, even if there's not a permanent injunction, I think we should be able to talk about that we've learned that open meetings law, the standard, is maybe higher than what we thought it was. Um, it's okay to make a mistake as long as we can admit, yes, I can do better. And the whole phone tag process of terminating a superintendent prior to a public meeting was not okay. Um, so those are the new learnings I think I really was hoping to hear more about, as opposed to blaming the plaintiff, is like Director Peterson said, this could have been done differently. Had it been done differently, we could have, and I would add, we could have saved the district a huge financial burden uh, had we done it differently. And, and that's the new learning, and that's why, again, I advocated for the safeguard in the superintendent contract, because I think those are the new learnings we need to take advantage of and do something different. So for me, the whereas statements that I really need to see are, as Director Williams agreed to, the, the motion for a preliminary injunction that was prohibiting further violations of the Colorado Open Meetings Law was filed and a court hearing was conducted on February 25th, 2022. I think that leads off and, and gives us a start date of when this all happened. Um, I appreciate uh, Director Peterson's willingness to add into the whereas statement on June 16th that we need to add specifically that the four directors who are hereafter referred to as defendants were enjoined from engaging in discussions of public business or taking formal action by three or more members of the board except in public meetings open to the public. I think we need to spell all that out so that we can really be very clear on what it was that you violated and what it is that you will not violate in the future. I personally think the SIDSIP information is important for our public because they've certainly seen SIDSIP uh, pay out our, our superintendent's lawsuit, but they but we are responsible for all of the fees for this particular lawsuit. Why is that? Because SIDSIP declined to cover the cost of the lawsuit because the allegations were considered intentional as opposed to negligent conduct. And that was dated back in February 18th uh, that we received that notification. Um, 
I think that's important for our public to understand because we're incurring a lot of cost. And they're going to ask, well, why didn't your insurance pay for it like you did with Superintendent Wise? Um, and then I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that the plaintiff did prevail. And I'm fine with not prevailing for the permanent injunction, but I think we need to say the, they, the plaintiff prevailed when it came to the court ruling that a violation to open meetings law uh, was made. So those are kind of my non-negotiables I can probably let go of the others. I think the ones that uh, Director Meek added as far as next steps under the therefore, I would advocate strongly for those as well because it shows our public again we learned something and here's what we're going to do in response to it. Um, and I think you had a couple of other whereas statements that you felt um, Director Meek should be in as well. So those are kind of where I'm at at this point. Yeah, just one response to two things. Um, I agree we may not have consensus on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh where our statement uh, that the board, I don't, it may not be unanimous, and based on your statement, it isn't, that the plaintiff is not entitled the full amount of fees. That's certainly my belief because of the multiple reconsideration motions that those were continued run-ups when we were ready to move on and close this case out as a board. But I'm happy to strike that entire whereas since it's not a unanimous. Uh, to address the SIPSIP coverage, I, I do not believe your statement regarding why SIPSIP refused to be accurate. We were initially assigned uh, Hall and Evans from SIPSIP. But when they found, in my recollection, that there was no monetary um, damages being sought or other things, there was nothing for them to insure, which is why they declined coverage, because there was no payment to be made on behalf of SIDSIP. So that was my recollection, not due to um, any type of intentionality or anything on their part. Um, what I would offer, Director Ray, just um, trying to keep notes on all this, would be to amend the first whereas statement where it says all the way through the, um, the, the court uh, number there, litigation, and on February 5th, 2022, a preliminary injunction was held and a temporary injunction was issued as a result. Second whereas statement, uh, as it reads, third way or a statement to add on that says uh, issued its finding of fact and collusions and the individually named defendants were found in violation of Colorado uh, open meeting law to document that. Um, on the next whereas statement, we could just say, whereas the plaintiff has expressed a desire to appeal part of the ruling, because I think that is important to include in there, but we can get rid of the happy, unhappy. I don't think anybody was completely happy, but I think that his desire to appeal is critical to this resolution. And then I already mentioned uh, striking the, um, the whole whereas statement around um, the board believes the plaintiff is not entitled the full amount. I think that gets the main meat of what you're trying to get in there, the guilty verdict, the disposition, the fact that there was a preliminary injunction uh, or a preliminary injunction hearing and a preliminary injunction was used, uh, was, excuse me, was issued that the four named defendants uh, were found in violation of Colorado Open Meeting Law. And I'm, I'm trying to, without amending, you know, making this an 85 page uh, summary of the entire court proceedings, trying to document what you said uh, in there. Um, again, I think the learning here, there, there's a lot of learning and I would just ask you, um, I certainly learned and stated what I would do differently. I would also propose that the reaction um, on behalf of other board members could have been different as well. There, there was still an opportunity after the conversation to come together as a board and have discussions as a board instead of a unilateral meeting and a, um, a walkout and basically a strike on behalf of the union in response. So uh, I'm not going to ask you to respond to that. I'm just saying in hindsight in 2020, I think there's a lot of things that many of the board members would have done differently. Um, I certainly would have used a very different process. Uh, going forward, and, and I think it's a, a lot of good lessons learned. And again, I'll echo, I appreciate carrying that learning through to some of the policy things that we talked about tonight, specifically safeguards for future superintendents and board members. Um, other director comments, Director Weiniger. 
Um, just to expand on the why we lost the insurance coverage was there was an original complaint filed that had four claims and it included a civil conspiracy claim asserting injury in fact, which sought damages. And once that claim was removed was when our insurance dropped us. So one could speculate why it got removed and hoping that insurance would drop us, who knows, but that's what happened. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind, Director Peterson, um, repeating the WERA statement you were adding that listed um, the ruling, I believe, from the findings of fact and conclusions. Yeah, it's the third statement and the revised third statement would read, whereas on June 16, 2023, the district court issued its findings of fact and conclusions of law and the named individual defendants were found in violation of Colorado open meeting law. Director Williams. I just want a motion to approve with the amended changes. Okay, we have a motion by Williams to approve the resolution with the amendments as stated. Do we, we have a second? Director Pearson, second. I'm sorry. Are we, are we done? I mean, I, I don't know that we finished Director Meek's input. I mean, I appreciate that this so far is all of my input, but yeah, I think we, Director Meek was making recommendations too. Yeah, we can take a subsequent motion then okay. to to add more to it with Director Meeks. We have currently have a motion to approve the resolution as stated with the amendments, um, as I stated by Director Williams. Do we have a second? I'll second. Director Page, second. Um, Director Meek, did you have a subsequent motion to further amend with additional whereas, uh, excuse me, uh, resolution statements? Yeah, I'm happy to make a motion to amend. I just think it's helpful for you to state exactly where we are right now with, because we've yeah, struck, I'll read, I'll read, we've struck I'll read, certain things. Yep, I'll read, the, I'll read the whole thing. Mr. Blair, if you can go back up to the top. Thank you. Uh, title remains intact as is. I'll start with the first whereas statement. Whereas Robert Marshall filed a lawsuit against the Board of Education, the board styled Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education at L, Douglas County District Court case number 2022 CV 30071 litigation. And on February 5th, 2022, preliminary, a preliminary injunction hearing was held and a temporary injunction was issued. Whereas a trial to uh, the court occurred on June 12, 2023, and whereas on June 16, 2023, the district court issued its finding of fact and conclusions of law, and the individual named defendants were found in violation of Colorado open meeting law. Whereas plaintiff uh, has expressed a desire to appeal part of the ruling, and whereas plaintiff is entitled to his reasonable attorney fees and costs under CRS 24-6, 4029B and whereas plaintiff has claimed to have incurred $99,330.50 uh, in attorney fees and 3677.34 in costs and whereas plaintiff has offered to agree not to not file an appeal regarding this case if defendants will agree to pay the full amount of his submitted fees and costs therefore be it resolved Mr. Blair if you can scroll down Thank you. Therefore, be it resolved, the board hereby authorizes the district to pay plaintiff the amount in attorney fees and the amount in costs in exchange for plaintiff agreeing not to file an appeal regarding this case. That was the um, amended and motioned resolution. So I move to amend the resolution to include a therefore statement now, therefore, be it resolved that as the DCSD Board of Ed will take the following steps to address um, these violations and safeguard the best interests of our district, implement regular board self-evaluation of its policies to ensure compliance with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. Can you read just the from implement? Implement regular board self-evaluation of its policies to ensure compliance with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. Okay, thank you. 
We have a subsequent motion by Director Meek as stated. Um, do we have a second? Second. A motion by Meek, second by Ray. We'll now take up discussion of the second, uh, the subsequent motion made by Director Meek. Director, questions, comments? Director Myers. One of the things that I felt, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you since I started on this board two years ago, I have made plenty of mistakes and I'll be one of the first ones to admit when I make a mistake because I, then I seek to try to fix those mistakes and do the best that I can. So there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn in this job. You come in thinking you're passionate about something and there's quite a bit to learn. Now, one of the things that I think about the where, therefore, be it resolved, I feel like that has been answered through the judge removing the permanent injunction and trusting that we will now do what we, he trusted that we will now follow, out of the, follow the Colorado Open Meeting Law and we can therefore start new. And that was one of the things that Mr. Marshall did not like is that that judge simply trusted us to go forward and be the board that we needed to be. Director Ray. And, and just in response to that, you are correct, uh, Director Myers, that the judge did have that, but we, we are responsive to our community um, in addition to the court. And I think that's where Director Meek's intended addition was, is to say to our community, what have we learned from this? We have spent a quarter million dollars on this issue. We better have something to show for it. And I believe that's the reason Director Meek is asking us to add that action item to show, yes, we learned a lesson, and here's how we're going to train ourselves up so that we are even better at governing in the future. Director Meek. Yeah, so thank you, Director Ray. I will kind of explain my, my thinking a little further here. Um, not only did we violate the open meeting law, we violated our board policies, okay? The board is, we tell our public in our board policies, we say the president has no authority to supervise or direct the superintendent or to take action concerning employment or termination of the superintendent. We, we have all kinds of statements in our board policies that were broken. The board cannot take action outside of the entire board voting on things. Like There were violations that happened that are related to our policies. We, I, I am so thankful that this board has reinstituted our monitoring reports on our superintendent and the staff. That is wonderful. But what we haven't put in place is our own monitoring, which is called self-evaluation. And that's a really important part of our job. We need to hold ourselves accountable that we are abiding by our policies. And so that is what this statement that I am proposing is really committing to our public, that we will implement regular board self-evaluation of our policies um, with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. So, you know, the court case didn't go into detail, but, you know, the, as you just said, uh, Director Myers, four of you were elected, you had two months of experience when this happened. It's a really steep learning curve to become a board member and to understand everything that's required. And there's a steep cost to when you mess up. And I think if we can tell our community that we are committed to living up to our policies and we're committed to doing better, I think that is helping to restore the trust that has been lost. And so for me, this is, this is us being proactive. It's not us blaming other people for mistakes that were made. And we can do better. And I think we, we need to do better. 
other directors still discussing the subsequent motion for the additional resolution? Director Williams. So first, um, to follow up on what Director Meyer said, yes, I mean, I, I'm learning every day. Not, not, I mean, just as a human in life, but certainly as a board member and learning the ins and outs. I mean, it is, to your point, Director Meek, a very steep learning curve. And certainly there have been a lot of lessons learned in this entire process. Um, having said that, I think that tonight we're here to just settle this case and I feel like the therefore be it resolved does exactly that. And if we want to have a discussion um, at another meeting to talk about, you know, what, what we want to do and how we want to govern as a board and discussions we want to have, I'm certainly open to that discussion. Um, but to put it in, in this resolution, I don't feel is necessary. Other directors? I'll add my two cents as one director. Uh, director Meek, you just said we have it. We've got it in the board policies. I don't think we need to add it as a specific um, resolution that we will comply with board policies. In terms of rebuilding trust, I would say that, uh, how many months did you say this? Uh, 19, thank you, Director Ray. Um, you know, in, since the preliminary injunction was issued, one of the things I think the court found uh, was that during those 19 months while we were going out, we didn't have any further issues or problems with that. I would say that the beginning of repairing trust started back then, and we have a chance to put a period on this particular item tonight and move forward. Um, so I would suggest that we um, get this resolution as approved in the primary motion. If we want to discuss further training we need or remedial things, certainly with uh, we're going to have a change out of at least one director, possibly up to three coming up here. I think that is a great thing to take up for this December for our winter retreat because we're going to have um, some new board members. So rather than uh, do anything here with this board, I would uh, highly suggest we add that to an agenda item for the December board retreat, specifically highlighting interpretation of Colorado open meeting laws and other, and the GP expectation, the policy of all board directors, not just newly appointed and sworn in directors, but existing directors as well. Director Myers, go ahead. So exactly what I was thinking, a great win, uh, winter board retreat. And with that being said, to get a period on this resolution, I would like to motion, call a vote that we now, with the whereas that we've amended, and to keep the therefore be it resolved as said as a motion and go forward with a, a call to vote. Point of order. Go ahead, Director Meek. So there is a motion on the table, right? Okay. Yeah, but we, we have a primary motion and we can't call the question on the primary motion with a subsequent motion on the table. Um, you could call the question on the subsequent motion, which means go right to a vote, but I think we're about ready to do that anyway. So we need to resolve the subsequent motion. Then we can come back to either further uh, discussion of the primary motion, or if you wish to call the question at that time on the primary motion, you can do so, but we have to resolve the subsequent motion. Does that make sense? Okay. Director A. I think it's referred to as a secondary motion, secondary. but um, I would like to hear Director Meek's recommendation for the therefore, because I kind of lost. Yeah, if you can, re the, if you can restate it, Director Meek. Sure. It was, now therefore be it resolved that the DCSD Board of Ed will take the following step to address these violations and safeguard the best interests of our, of our district. Implement regular board self-evaluation of its policies to ensure compliance with the law, fiduciary responsibilities, and the principles of effective governance. Okay, hey, thank you, Director Meek. That is the motion, the subsequent motion. A vote for that will only amend the document. A vote against that will not amend the document vote on the subsequent motion does not affect the overall passage or rejection of the resolution in whole. 
So with that, I will take a vote on the subsequent motion. So just so we're all clear here as directors, you're not voting. Secondary. No, I'm sorry, secondary, thank you. Uh, on the secondary motion, um, this is not voting to approve or reject the entire, this is just to approve or reject the amendment with the therefore statement as stated by Director Meek. Director Myers. Does that mean the whereas that we've talked about is that not on this right that now? That is not being discussed. It is just simply whether to add the therefore be that it resolved statement Meek. or not to add it. We will come back to the primary motion, um, and the primary motion will either be to approve with all amendments if the, sub if the okay. secondary passes or to approve without the secondary amendment. So therefore be resolved what Director Meek spoke to, and I as what? And I, as you would like to amend the resolution with the language proposed by Director Meek, and nay, is you would not like to amend the resolution with the languages proposed by Director Meek. Okay, I think I got okay. it. All right. With that, I will take the roll call vote on the secondary motion as proposed by, as uh, made by Director Meek and seconded by Director Ray. Director Meek. Yeah, if it helps, I think it's called an amendment to the amendment. And it gets to be really confusing. Yeah, it gets to be all so, like a bunch of so Russian nested dolls. So we're voting on dolls. my amendment to the other amendment. Correct. And, you know, I just really want to encourage everyone to remember that the ballots are coming out in weeks. And, you know, I, I think giving people language where we are committing as a board to regularly review our own policies and be transparent with that would go a long way to helping to build and restore trust. And for that reason, I'm voting aye. Meek is an aye. Director Myers. Nay. Director Page. While I agree, you know, in, in concept to what Director Meek is saying, um, I think we can address that elsewhere. This thing is specifically about ending this thing. So I'm going to vote no. Director Peterson, no. Director Ray. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is what harm is done by including this language in this resolution? And, and I see no harm. If, if anything, I just see that it's clarifying for our community, lesson learned, here's what we're going to do in a proactive manner to continue to govern with excellence. And so I, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that we're missing out on an opportunity to communicate to our community that we, ha we are learners. And in order for us to be better about our governance, we will do the things that Director Meek has listed. So absolutely, I'm, a, I'm an I for that reason. Okay, Director Williams. No. Director Weiniger. No. The secondary motion, as we've been calling it, is defeated by a vote of five, two to five. We now will take up the primary motion on the floor, which was a motion made by Williams, seconded by Page, to approve the resolution, uh, as I read previously, with all the amendments to the whereas statements. A friendly amendment. You missed one of my... Um, recommendations. I don't know if that was intentional or just, but in the in the section where it says, um, whereas plaintiff has claimed to have incurred ninety nine thousand in attorney fees and thirty six hundred in cost, um, and as the prevailing party for the allegation of Colorado Open Meetings Law violation, the prevailing party is entitled to reimbursement of his reasonable attorney's cost. I think that's an important statement to make because if he's not the prevailing party and or he's not entitled to his cost, why are we doing this? If I may uh 
uh, Director Ray, I think we may be able to put that better in the whereas statement above. So modifying the whereas statement above that one to whereas the plaintiff as the prevailing party in the Colorado Open Meeting Law charge is entitled to his reasonable attorney's fees and costs under the CRS because that way it links links it to the actual statute if you'll accept that. I accept. I accept D that. Director what? Sorry, Director Williams. Well, since I was the one that made the motion, I accept the friendly amendment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, do I need to read the entirety of revisions one last time? I'm, I'm happy to do so. Okay. So, Mr. Blair, again, if we can go back up to the top and track, we'll read what is being, um, we have an, exception, an accepted amendment to the original motion. So the motion on the floor is to approve the resolution um, as amended, and I will read the amended resolution in total. Resolution of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District RE1 regarding attorney's fees in the matter of Robert Marshall v. Douglas County Board of Education and all case number 2022 CV 30071. Whereas Robert Marshall filed a lawsuit against the Board of Education, the board style Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education at Al, Douglas County District Court case number 200CV30071 litigation. And on February 5th, 2022, preliminary injunction hearing was held and a temporary injunction was issued. Whereas a trial to the court occurred on June 12th, 2023, and whereas on June 16, 2023, the district court issued its finding of fact and conclusions of law and the individual named defendants were found in violation of Colorado open meeting law, whereas the plaintiff, whereas the whereas plaintiff has expressed a desire to appeal part of the ruling and whereas the plaintiff as the prevailing party in the Colorado open meeting law charge is entitled to, in, entitled to his reasonable attorney fees and costs under CRS 2464029B, and whereas plaintiff has came, claimed to incur that amount and attorney's fees and that amount in costs, and whereas the plaintiff, plaintiff has offered to agree not to file an appeal regarding this case if defendants will agree to pay the full amount of his submitted fees and costs. Therefore, be it resolved, the board hereby authorizes the district to pay plaintiff $99,330.50 in attorney's fees and $3,677.34 in costs in exchange for plaintiff agreeing not to file an appeal regarding this case. That is the uh, entire resolution as amended. If there is, Director Meek? Yeah. I move to amend the amended resolution to include the name defendants in this. Do you mean an actual listing of the individual named defendants? Yes. I'm happy to do so. That would be the one, two, third where a statement, it would say, uh, and the name defendants comma, we would list the four named directors. Um, and comma were found in violation and I don't think I need to read the whole thing again I know what technically wasn't it the district and the name defendants the there the defendants in the case uh, technically was the Douglas County Board of Education yeah. and for technically named defendants so technically and we could ask mr. blue technically um, the board and the four named defendants were found in violation of Colorado open meeting law so I'm happy to leave it as individual named defendants or I could put the board and the individual named defendants and list the named defendants if that's what you're looking for yeah maybe we can get clarity from mr. blue it's just when I read what verbatim was from the judgment it says the court finds that the plaintiff has proved that the individual defendants conduct was in violation of the Colorado open meeting law mr. blue the, yes that is exactly what the order says but by finding that the judge is also finding that the board as a whole violated the law because they were the they were the majority who were acting at that time yeah, I'm fine with the board and the individual defendants with the names I think the amendment, if I will, Mr. Uh, Director Peterson, I think the I think it's what Director Meek just stated. Um, and as we already said, we don't want to replicate everything that came out of the court hearing. And I, I appreciate 
Mr. Blue's statement, but it, uh, we've already said that at the very first whereas statement that this lawsuit was against the Board of Education. So I would be opposed to the amendment other than stating that the individual defendants, as it was read from the ruling of the court order, enlisting those individual defendants. The ruling didn't list them, though, right? Sorry? Say it again. I believe the ruling didn't list the named defendants. It just said the named defendants, I believe. Right, but then we, the debate was whether or not to include the board and the individual oh. defendants. And I'm saying, I just want individual defendants with the names listed. Yeah. Oh, with the names. Yeah. So, so, Director Williams, it was your original motion, the friendly amendment proposed by Director Meek, and I will read just that whereas statement. Whereas on June 16, 2023, the district court issued its finding of facts and conclusions of law and the individual named defendants, Michael Peterson, Christy Williams, Becky Myers, and Kaylee Weiniger, end quote, uh, comma, were found in violation of Colorado Open Meeting Law. Is that the suggested uh, friendly amendment? No, Director Meek. So that's to you, Director Williams. I, if, if we add the board in just to be consistent, I would be fine with that. So you're looking to make it findings of fact of conclusion and conclusions of law and the board and the named individual defendants as listed is what you're accepting? Yes, either that or as the judge wrote, named defendants. The named defendants would be fine as well. But then, but then not listed unless you include the board. Director Meek, are you happy with adding in the board and the individual named defendants in a listing? That sounds fine. Okay. If there's no further discussion, I'd like to... So I want to make... Go ahead. You want me to read it one more time? I will read it. Just that whereas statement. Just that whereas. Whereas on June 16, 2023, the district court issued its findings of fact and conclusion of uh, and conclusions of law and the Board of Education and the named individual defendants, comma, Michael Peterson, Christy Williams, Becky Myers, and Kaylee Weininger, comma, were found in violation of Colorado Open Meeting Law. Okay. If there is no more discussion, I will take a vote on the primary motion, which is to approve the resolution as amended multiple times and just stated. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Page. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Director Ray. So I, I appreciate the work we've done. Um, and I appreciate the willingness to include my input into the resolution. I, I have really struggled with this for the last couple of days of what I would vote. Um, I think Director Meek said it earlier, it makes me ill to think that this cost us over a quarter million of dollars, a quarter million of dollars to get to this point. And I'm really struggling with having my name on an eye for that reason. But given the willingness to accept mistakes and the willingness um, to look at how we can govern better, although I'm a little bit disappointed that we didn't get that in the therefore statement, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and vote aye. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weininger. Aye. Passed by a vote of 7 to 0. We'll now move into uh, item number 25, selection of voting delegate for Colorado Association of School Boards, CASB 2023 Delegate Assembly. The recommendation is the board select a delegate to participate and vote in the October 7, 2023 Colorado Association of School Board Delegate Assembly. Um, background on this is each district gets to have one and only one, doesn't matter size, um, delegate to vote at that assembly. Uh, last year, I think the biggest thing that came out of that was an approval by the assembly to include remote voting. So we are, are remote located, smaller districts, uh, didn't have to travel all the way to Colorado Springs or Denver and could uh, participate in that process. Uh, traditionally, we have the president of the board attend and represent the board in that vote. However, I will be uh, out of town, out of the state, on October 7th, so we will need, as a board, to appoint someone to uh, represent this board as a voting delegate to that assembly. 
Do I have any motions or discussion around a delegate to represent the Board of Education at the Casby Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly on October 7th, 2023? Some question. Go ahead, Director Ray. So I know in, a, in our communication file, Director Peterson, you had already stated to Tracy DeMeo that um, Vice President Williams would be our delegate. So I just want to make sure we're not just being a rubber stamp here. I mean, is this still? No, that, that's on there because I had assumed that since we had designated the president that the vice president would stand. Uh, actually, Director Williams called me and said she would feel more comfortable with a vote of the board. Um, so uh, Assistant Secretary Brockman is basically <laughs> holding that spot saying, hey, hold on, we'll get you a name the board's meeting on Tuesday, thus this discussion. Thank you. And then my second question really is having been on the board for several years and, and watched and have been a delegate, et cetera, um, this board is unique in that we have very differing opinions, especially when CASB has a slew of resolutions that they want to hear the delegates' feedback about. And so I'm just wondering how will Director Williams know how to represent the board um, on all these resolutions, given that we are a very diverse group of people. Director Williams. Yeah, so I think last year at the winter retreat at CASB, we had a very lengthy discussion about legislative priorities, and then we voted on them at a subsequent meeting. Um, and so I think that I could, I feel like I could represent the board with the legislative priorities that were um, put forth by the board. And if for some reason, I, I mean, I would commit to, if for some reason I felt like there was one on there that I couldn't make a decision on based upon our legislative priorities that I would abstain from voting. So. Right. Director Meek. Have you had a chance to do a crosswalk on those to see which ones maybe don't align with our legislative platform? I know historically we would dedicate time on a board agenda to walk through the, the resolution book, right? And usually whoever would serve as the delegate would lead that conversation and kind of walk through here's how we're voting, or if there's something. So I think there's bylaw conversation or a vote that's happening um, for changing their bylaws. So I just think we as a board need to have a conversation and we task you with voting for the board, right, at that, if you are the delegate. So I'm just wondering, um, it's like a 50-page book. I think I think it's rather long and lengthy. So I'm just wondering how we all are able to uh, give you what you need to represent our board. And if you've been able to look at it and see, these are the items that I need guidance from the board. And the bylaws is just the one thing that kind of popped into my mind. Yeah, to be truthful, I have not spent a ton of time simply because we hadn't had this discussion to appoint someone and I wasn't going to you know, read 50 pages um, if, if, you know, the board decided not to appoint me to, um, to that position or, but I, I just would like to throw my name in the hat that I would be willing to do that um, if the board would allow that, so. Yeah, and just as a, a matter of time and space, the, the uh, convention is a week from Saturday. So we're, we're on a pretty short timeline. Director Ray. So is, is Director Williams the only director that is wanting to throw their hat in to be designated as our delegate? That, or? that is an outstanding question. We have no <laughs> motions. Are there any other directors that would like to represent the district at CASB? It is a, it is a Saturday and it is a multi-hour affair. Uh, it is noted it's in uh, Glenwood, Glenwood, Glenwood Springs. Um, so you can either attend in person or, thanks to last year's vote by the committee, <laughs> you can actually attend remotely, but there is credentials and you've got to get issued a set of credentials and passwords and stuff and uh, only, delegate, only appointed delegates may attend virtually. Director Ray. Well, I, I really like what Director Williams said, that her guardrails are, are legislative priorities. And I, and I really think that holding true to that you know, if there are bylaws that we don't speak to in our legislative priorities, you wouldn't vote. You would just hold 
you wouldn't you just wouldn't place a vote for that for those particular items. So, um, so I, I, I appreciate that explanation. And I would move that uh, we nominate Director Williams as the delegate to attend the uh, CASB delegate assembly. We have a yeah. motion by Director Ray. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Page. Okay, without discussion, I will take the roll on the motion. Director Meek. So I'm excited. We will have a representative there. I think it's a very interesting process. There's amendments on amendments and everything. Um, I would appreciate if, if, as you do your homework, if perhaps you shared to the entire board, you know, because it does take homework to be prepared, to, to be there and to know how to vote. Um, if, if you would be willing to provide, you know, a summary to us as to where, you know, your thinking is and, and how it aligns with everything. Um, and given that, um, I'm excited that you'll be able to do that. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Page. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Am I allowed to vote for myself? Aye. Weiniger. <laughs> aye. Passed seven to zero. Moving into our final items. Uh, President report, Board of Education work study session is scheduled uh, for October 10th. That will be, we only have one meeting, excuse me, in October. So that'll be more like a regular meeting. We'll have public comment, action items, all those things uh, coming up. Agenda planning for the 10 October meeting is scheduled for Thursday, uh, the 28th, two days from now at 10.30 a.m. Um, October 10th is the last Board of Education meeting prior to the November 7th election. Uh, I am told the Tabor book should be mailed out of roughly on October 6th. may take you a couple days to get it. I'd like to thank Director Ray uh, for offering some of the pro comments along with other folks that will be, uh, that have been um, merged by uh, Assistant Secretary Brockman in her official capacity. Um, I am told ballots will be mailed out around the 16th of October. So look for those in the mail, but we will only have one more uh, board meeting prior to the November 7th election. So for those listening at home, if you'd love to come speak uh, about the ballot measures, both for and against, please sign up for public comment um, and make your voices heard. Um, again, looking to attract, uh, retain, recognize staff, uh, a lot of stuff that we've mentioned time and time and time again. Uh, just this evening while we were meeting, the Highlands Ranch Metro District uh, voted to uh, unanimously to pass a resolution in support of 5A and 5B. So by my counting and inventory, and some pe people collect me, uh, every one of our towns and cities and councils uh, voted to pass this, with the exception of the Parker uh, Town Council. However, the Parker Chamber of Commerce uh, did vote uh, strongly in support of a resolution uh, to pass leaving Parker out on an island. Um, but everyone else here in Douglas County, uh, very strong support for 5A and 5B. Um, for those at home that still want to get involved, investindcsd.com is the website. An independent committee is set up. There is plenty of volunteer opportunities. There is literature. There is information. There is an opportunity to knock on doors to join uh, other folks on their independent time. As our staff knows, they cannot uh, advocate during the work day uh, on hours, but they're certainly allowed to do things after hours on the weekends as individual citizens and join some of our board members who have been out knocking and will continue to be out uh, knocking, painting cars, and spreading the good word about 5A, 5B. Um, last thing on a personal note, I spent the last week up in a energy plant in Minnesota with a whole bunch of unionized millwrights and engineers and stuff. And what it really showed me is it, it really shone a light on Douglas County and specifically the CTE and STEM education we have. Um, I was in a plant that only had two generators. One of them was being pulled offline for a planned outage. And but for the engineering skill coming together with, and if you don't know what a millwright is, man, uh, 
shout out to Oscar and our other welding instructors. If you've got welding skills, you've got a job in industry and what it takes to bring the engineers together with the workers and get that thing off, get it serviced and get it back online was an absolute thing of beauty and art, literally keeping the lights on uh, in the town to our north. And it's those type of future workers, whether the engineers, whether the tradesmen, whether you're taking those skills and thanks to uh, assistant um, superintendent Windsor, Dr. Core, Dan McMinimi, everyone is, of course, the superintendent that has pushed the CTE program to see what CTE looks like in the workplace. Uh, and I'm telling you, just up there, you start probationarily at 75,000 and you're making 85,000 as soon as you do your couple jobs as a welder. So students, if you're still listening, <laughs> CTE is great and strong and we need you out there in the workforce. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Vice President Williams for uh, her comments as the CASB delegate and in her official duties as the Vice President. So first, um, thanks for trusting me to be the delegate for CASB. I will do my very best to <laughs> try to summarize um, as I can over the next week. Um, but if any of you find uh, time in your schedules and you <laughs> want to give me any information or thoughts on any of the things in the booklet, I would be happy to um, read and take that on. Um, Director Page and I had the opportunity to go with Superintendent Kane, um, Principal Andy Abner, uh, Principal Andy Abner and Principal um, Katie Lynch last week to HRCA for the presentation on funding and so that went really well. Um, and then Thursday last week, Director Ray and I had the opportunity to go to uh, celebrate Hope's fundraiser in which they have annually to bring in money um, just to, to help fund all of all of their wonderful things that they do throughout the entire state of Colorado. So just a, a, a really nice time talking with all sorts of people from all, all around. I, I spoke to some people that drove all the way up from Canyon City to be a part of that fundraiser. So anyway, just a lot of really good things happening in the district and I would just urge anybody interested in helping with the 5A, 5B campaign to go to investindcsd.com. Thanks. Okay, I think we went this way. So we'll go, we'll start with Director Meek and work down towards Director Page. Director Meek. Sure. I think tomorrow I will be at the Parker Chamber Government Affairs Committee meeting. I'm not sure who else is attending that one. It looks like David, maybe. Yes, Director Ray. Um, so that'll be tomorrow. And I've been out knocking on doors every weekend. Everyone wants to support our teachers as and our staff and our employees. Um, lots of really positive support. And I'm hopeful that tonight will help put some things behind us and hopefully move us forward. And um, Friday night is Building the Dream Gala, so looking forward to that. And I think that's all I have. Director Ray. Yeah, I want to just uh, piggyback on way earlier in the meeting when Superintendent Kane talked about the Hispanic Heritage Celebration, had the pleasure of being at Castle Rock Middle School and meeting the uh, Council General Melendez Cruz, um, and as uh, Superintendent Kane described, brought a, um, a band of young musicians that performed for the entire student body. They were from Huaca, Mexico. Um, but this is a moment that I just want to share with you that will forever stick with me. Uh, he and I were sitting together, kind of in the balcony seats, looking down at the stage as they were performing, and the students just loved it. The students were great. They were enjoying uh, the performance, and he said, he just turned to me, uh, and he said, we, we have a surprise for you. And um, near the end of the performance, the last song they performed was the national anthem, the United States national anthem. And I mean, we, we both stood up, and to see his pride of his country, as well as his pride for our country, um, I will be standing for the national anthem with a whole different uh, vision in my head and he just a, a really a really amazing man in the things he's doing for uh, Immigration and for Mexico so thoroughly enjoyed that um, And then I think we shouted out to Rocio Meli who's the Spanish teacher there as well as the principal John Vite. Um He was also acknowledged for just great work 
in how he is uh, making sure that we're doing cultural responsive learning with students. Uh, there were probably, I think he said, there were about 60 students uh, that he has that has immigrated from Mexico that's, that attends Castle Rock Middle School. Just not your typical image of a Douglas County school and just seeing their pride of seeing their culture celebrated uh, was, was, was pretty incredible. So shout out to Castle Rock Middle School. I was in this Hispanic heritage celebration mode, so I went on to the Conexion celebration at Legacy Campus. Um, but this volunteer group is incredible. Um, their, their, their charge is to make sure that there's a sense of community for parents that come into our um, county that, that don't speak the English language, um, and these are the these are the things that they uh, do. They elevate the voice of bilingual parents. They ensure that they have representation within when making uh, decisions. They help parents get involved in school activities, and they promote the inclusion of bilingual parents by helping them overcome fear. Um, but as director, again, Superintendent Kane described, it was uh, a wonderful celebration, the best tamales I have ever had. Um, and yes, indeed, piñatas, music, student performances, speeches, it was incredible. I do want to uh, say these people's names out loud because this is the group that is making it happen for our students. And we have a significant group of students who these, this group is supporting, so Alejandro, Palacios is the Conexion president, Marisol Perez is the vice president, Angelica Cantillo, uh, Aurora Antonio, Virginia Lawyer, Oscar Gonzalez, and Carla uh, Yanez um, are the people on this board. And they even offer parents, while the, parent, while the students are going to school, the parents, at, for instance, at our South Elementary School, are learning English. They're, they're, have, there's tutors, there's volunteers that are teaching these parents um, English language while their students are in school. So anyway, they're an incredible organization. Just wanted to shout out to them. One other shout out that I don't, I'm a little biased, but is we, I went to the Douglas County School District Marching Band Showcase. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always feel like that our band people, right, Director Page, don't get as much attention as our sports people. And so it was great to be there, but what was really um, just put the ice in the cake, there was a whole troop of students, um, I think it was from Thunder Ridge High School that were in the stands, just yelling and cheering for their marching band. And so that was uh, an incredible moment as well. Um, and then as Director Williams stated, Hope Denim and Diamonds fundraiser was a wonderful activity. Um, I just want to... I know Jake did a really good job capturing the student advisory group, but in their resolution, I want to just highlight a couple things. Uh, one of the statements they made, and they truly, I gave them some examples of resolutions that have been written, but they pretty much came up with this on their own. Um, and it doesn't sound like students necessarily, but if you listen to it, it really should get to us. This is one of the things they say. They talked about the issues, the challenges that the district is dealing with, and they said these issues pose a clear and immediate threat to students' educational quality, educational outcomes, and academic excellence. Collectively, we urge that Douglas County unite to support the students, the community of which we are a part, and the families looking to make DCSD their home by voting yes on 5A and 5B. When you think about our students are saying, if we don't get this thing done, there's a threat to the quality of my education. That should resonate for every person in our community uh, and their plea that we let the community unite to support our students. So I just wanted to emphasize those words and say, let's, let's get her done. That's it. Director Myers. Director Mink, you'll be happy I don't have a video tonight. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, Youth Congress a week from today. So kids uh, can ride the bus. We need to meet at the Legacy Campus at 715. Last year it was stormy. It was snowy. I rode the bus. I'm riding the bus again. So I, I ride the bus with the kids. It's, I, it's more fun anyway. 
Um, I did not get to attend the diamonds and denim and diamonds, but I did go. Well, I don't have a video, but I do have a brochure. So I did go to the Douglas County Community Foundation Heroes Gala. It was phenomenal. It was the at the Denver Botanic Gardens at Chatfield. It was beautiful. It was that beautiful, beautiful fall night. I think we had every square inch of that. We had a huge tent up. We, I think we had over 600 people there. We honored our heroes, our first responders. Kendra Castillo, Castillo we honored as our fallen hero. It was just, it was a tear-filled night. It was just a great place to go and see the beauty of everything and see our community come together. We actually raised over $600,000. Um, but my biggest shout out, my kids. I had four SAG kids show up because uh, they needed volunteers. I had a, a student from who was from my church and also from Rock Canyon High School. But I'm giving the biggest shout out to Marshawn Uhas and Rachel Rents, Rents, Rents at Thunder Ridge High School because I was getting a little afraid, and she brought. 10 Pro Start students to work the gala. They had a small checklist. What? Culinary. Yeah, culinary. Uh, they call, and so when she's family and consumer science after my own heart. So these kids showed up and I was there to meet with them. Well, I didn't go hang out with the other people at the cocktail hour. I hung out with the kids because they had a list of duties and they went above and beyond because they got panicked in the tent and our kids went to work for the catering. They, and I went the next morning to help with a little bit of cleanup. And Marco, who uh, did this, who uh, put this gala together, said she was so impressed by our kids and the work they did, and they did not stop. And their teacher came. And so they got a little worried when they were told they might have to stay till 11.30. I didn't even stay till 11.30. But uh, they didn't. But they, they got to have a little fun, visit the animals, see all the, um, the equipment there, the helicopter flyover, the band that played, not a band, but a fiddle group. And it was a beautiful night, and they had fun too. So I wanted to say thank you, thank you to those students that came out and helped. Sorry, Director Weiner, you have to go after Director Myers. <laughs> well, I had an FOC meeting finally, and um, our, the new chair of FOC, James Coop, um, did a great introduction. We had three new members start as well, and um, I think we're going to have a great year with the FOC. We also went over um, fourth quarter financials and school carryover, which we voted on on consent agenda today. And um, we also uh, just went around and talked about what we were looking forward to um, in the areas of focus that we just also approved for FOC today. So thanks everyone for approving that. And then I have um, Inbox tomorrow and I'm also going to Building the Dream Gala on Friday. Looking forward to it. Director Page. All right, um, also going to the Gala on Friday. Really excited for that. Um, last week's DAC meeting, um, we didn't use Jamboard per Mr. Reynolds, but we actually did paper Jamboards all around this room um, going over um, meeting norms. And that was a really neat exercise. And um, when you say, you know, we want to start in on time, we want to actively listen to this to understand, come prepared and informed, um, you know, the norms of how we run a meeting, what does that actually mean? And so one of the things that DAC is um, – taking on all, you know, alongside of all the other things that we've now tasked them to do this year um, is to, you know, really, what does it mean to become, you know, to, to come to a DAC meeting and, and, and really kind of live out those norms. Uh, so it was a really neat exercise to go around and group them into, into different categories. Um, I think um, the UIP plan was, you know, conditionally approved. So, you know, appreciate the, the um, DAC's work on that. Uh, we had a presentation by Dr. Kirby around educator effectiveness. Uh, there's some changes in, in how um, that performance um, process um, is, is going to happen now. So DAC is charged to review that as well. Um, and I think we've um, 
given them a lot of work to do <laughs> over the next over the next year. Um, but it's a really engaged group. I appreciate um, you know all the talk, and I think we had several of the SAC um, liaisons slash you know leaders um, in our audience as well. Um, and I think from the discussions tonight. Um, Come to the come to the DAC meeting. You know, let's you know you want your voice to be heard and ha you know be involved in the discussions. Um, they're open to the public, so please come and 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 be involved. Um, and then one thing personal for me is um, there's a gentleman um, and his son who go to uh, go to my church, uh, Mission Hills. Um, he has severe special needs, but he's always at the very front listening to worship because that the son just loves the, the music and. They've had some struggles in the district, like trying to figure out, you know, a program for him. But landed at um, landed at Bridge, the Bridge program, and this is, I think, for me, like a personal charge for you know, five A and five B is that you know it takes special people to bring that special level of care and understanding and wanting to do that, and we need to pay those people to, to you know. To do that job well, and so um, knowing that they've found that person, but that person could leave at any mo point in time because they could make more money doing all sorts of other things. But their passion is working with those special needs students, especially in the bridge program. Um, so that's my plea to, you know, let's pay our teachers and our staff well. Um, you know, let's pass this thing so that we can we we can share more of those stories of how we're impacting even individual students. Um, with something like that. Director A. Just uh, to piggyback on um, Director Page's earlier statement about DAC, um, about please come to our meetings. I, I also wanted us to, I, I don't know that we publicly stated to the public commenters who said there's secret, secrecy around the membership. And that's not true. Uh, there's a whole process in which members go through to be interviewed and considered for DAC. And so I would also add on to what uh, Director uh, Page said is, look at the website, go to the DAC. This group is incredible. They've, they're well organized, they have bylaws, they, they have a process in place for, they have, they have diverse membership. And I don't know, if, Director Page, if you noticed that being new to that, but they're not all same common thinkers when it comes to social issues. And so I just wanted to put that out there because we had public commenters that made that accusation and I don't know that we corrected them in that. That's not true. It, this is all transparent and uh, a process and they can join DAC too if they would like. So anyway, I just wanted to piggyback and add on to that statement you were making. Yeah, I know good that comment. I think um, the comment was made in the, in the audience one of our breaks is that we had four openings and we literally had four people to fill that, so I think we have more than four people in the county. So um, I know when I ran for you know being on the board at Ben Franklin, I literally ran because there was one person running. So I just ran as I'll just be another choice, you know, just to give you know just to give that opportunity for people to make a choice. So um, yeah, charge all those people you know, feel strongly about it. Please put in an application and, and become a member uh, for sure. Okay, thank you. We're up to item number 29, adjournment. Motion Do I have to a, adjourn. We have a motion from <laughs> Director Williams. Second. Second by Page. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Page? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>